Today's buyers can't wait to escape suburbia and settle down in the countryside. A straight-talking couple set the bar high for our properties. Not as wide as I would like it. Smaller than what we've actually got at the moment. Yeah. Luckily, some rooms do measure up to their expectations. That's my perfect size kitchen. Just exactly what we need. Yeah, that's really nice. Today we're in Devon and this is the Grand Western Canal in Tiverton. Completed in 1814, the canal ran from Tiverton to Taunton across the border in Somerset and was designed so that tugboats carrying loads of up to 30 tonnes could be pulled along by a single horse. Now the calm waters meant there's very little resistance and this incredibly efficient use of horsepower was used successfully for around 200 years. Today, it's purely used for leisure purposes, but this barge, called the Tibetonian, and young Taffy here are just one of a small handful of horse and barge partnerships across the whole of the UK. The county of Devon is set in the southwestern sleeve of England. With distinctive coastlines totaling 450 miles in length, the northern shores benefit from rugged cliffs and golden sandy beaches, which look out over the Atlantic. To the south lie the popular seaside resorts of Paynton, Torquay and Brixham, which make up the English Riviera. Characterised by exotic palms, this area is home to one of the mildest climates in the country. Further along the coast is the sheltered harbour of Dartmouth, where the Pilgrim Fathers moored up in the Mayflower en route to the New World. Its sailing heritage is still very much in evidence today, with the Royal Naval College standing proud above the estuary. Inland, the sweeping hills of Dartmoor National Park are home to a scattering of attractive villages, such as Chagford and Lusty, with fine examples of traditional thatched cottages. Offering both coast and country, it's easy to see why Devon is an escapee's paradise, offering real potential to get away from it all. With so much on offer, it comes as no surprise that the average price of a detached home here in Devon is £25,000 more than the national figure, coming in at just over £307,000. And there are areas in this county where prices are even higher than that. For example, if you want to live near the highly desirable beaches and seaside towns of the English Riviera on the south coast, brace yourself to pay up to 20% more than a similar property inland. So what is it about this beautiful region that has so attracted today's buyers? Well, let's meet them and find out. Former property developers Karen and Keith met on a blind date set up by work colleagues 18 and a half years ago. Up until recently, their lives have been pretty full on with work, managing their own business. The idea of retiring as young as we have was really just to chill out and take things slowly. They both lived in Rochford near South End in Essex for most of their lives, but now they're no longer tied to the area for work. They can't wait to escape the ever-growing population moving to the town. We've always had fields behind this and it's always been very, very quiet. And then um, three years ago, uh, a developer put in plans for 600 houses and a school as well, um, which will just totally change um, our living, really. With six children and four grandchildren between them from previous relationships also leading their own busy lives, now it's all about investing in their own future. You've only got one life and you've only got one go at it. So... I think you should fit in as much as you can. We haven't got to worry about anyone else anymore. It's just our time. Yeah, <laughs> sounds like you care about me. I do. <laughs> <laughs> They've decided to move to Devon because Karen has many happy memories of spending holidays there as a child. It's beautiful down there. You've got the beaches, you've got the countryside, and it's just somewhere I've always wanted to go. And you like the clotted cream? I actually don't like quite clotted cream, no. <laughs> As self-proclaimed socialites, they're also looking forward to making new friends and pursue leisure activities which they've never had time to do before now. We would like to get involved with the community and I would like to do start up a supper club and invite people around for dinner because I do like doing, you know, dinner party entertaining. Yeah, I think just joining clubs and stuff yeah. that 
you know, whatever's going on, whether it's... I want to join a pensioner's cricket club. <laughs> Although they're planning to retire, Keith and Karen are also keen to maintain their young at heart attitude. Sometimes we'll go out, and, I don't know, one o'clock in the morning, we'll go, oh, let's go and get in the hot tub. In the middle of winter, in the rain. <laughs> I don't think we've ever acted our age. Still keep the element of uh, humour, don't we? <laughs> yeah, I have to. <laughs> they currently live in their own separate homes, so even though Karen regularly stays over at Keith's, a joint venture is definitely at the top of their agenda. This move will change our lives. We've never had a, our own house, so it'd be nice to get our own place and uh, choose it together. Um, and it'd be nice to live together after all these years. Despite decades of property development experience, Karen and Keith are unfamiliar with the housing market in Devon. They're optimistic about what the county has to offer and open-minded about location. I'm catching up with them to get a clearer picture of what they're hoping for from their new home. Well, Keith and Karen, welcome to beautiful Devon. Very young retirees, I have to say. Good moisturiser. Yes, that's what it is, that's <laughs> yeah. the answer. Yeah. I'm liking that, I need the secret. <laughs> what are you hoping to do when you make this move? I would like to just have more of a community life, join in with things and you know, see what's going on and you know, just get to know people and chill out, really, basically just enjoy yourselves, don't we, really? Now, both of you worked in the property business, so why do you need our help with this, Serge? You see, I am feeling the pressure. We're really hoping that you can find us something that we haven't seen before. What is it? What are we looking for? Detached. OK. Four bedrooms, three yeah. or four bedrooms. Um, hopefully, with a little bit of land, that would be nice. How so, much do you want, Keith? How much land? I'd like to say an acre plus. And, Karen, what about the actual style of the property? I quite like contemporary. Um, as long as it's really got a nice, big, modern kitchen, because I do like entertaining, I do like cooking, and that is usually our hub, isn't it? So it's got to be big enough to accommodate all the children, the grandchildren and our friends. What about the geography, the location within the county? We're open to any location as long as the house is right. And obviously it's within walking distance of a community. So you'd like basically. right on the edge of a village? The yeah. edge of a village Yeah, that'd be ideal, good. yeah. Remind us then of your budget, how much we've got to spend. We're looking around about the 450000 maybe uh, 475 if it's the right property. And do you think that's a realistic amount? I mean, Devon is an expensive county because so many people want to move here. Do you think, realistically, you're going to get everything that you want for that amount of money? We'd like to think so. That's, uh, you know, that's, we can get a property for that. But, I mean, if we've got to extend it a little bit more, then not a problem. You know, we can do that. OK. Well, we do have some splendid properties lined up to show you. It is a glorious day, I think. We have to get started. Right. <laughs> Follow me. With a maximum budget of £475,000, our couple are after a modern four-bedroom property which has enough sociable living space to accommodate visiting grandchildren and entertain their friends. They'd also ideally like an acre of land and to be on the edge of a village. We've got a diverse mix of properties in store, which addresses the various elements of their wish list. After every viewing, I'll be asking them to guess the price. Our final offering is the Mystery House, where unconventional living and 20th century technology have been thrown into the mix to challenge their property buying preconceptions. The reason I want your help is with Keith, he knows what he wants, and I think this will give him a bit of a broader outlook on properties. So Keith, are you less flexible? Would that be fair to say? I know what we want. That's, the, that's you know, well, what we're looking for. So are you the one that I might have to convince? Do you reckon Karen's going to be easier? Or Karen's is really more flexible, yeah. I'm definitely yeah. more yeah. flexible. Karen's definitely more flexible. It shows always says, Keith's never happy, but I mean, uh, <laughs> yeah, I am. <laughs> if we can find the right property, I will be. Well, we're not too far from the first one. Let's see if we can at least get a smile out of you. With location top of the agenda, our property search begins in the rural village of Georgium. There are more amenities a couple of miles away in the coastal village of Croyd, which lies within the North Devon area of outstanding natural beauty. Facing west, the windswept waters of the Atlantic 
and vast sandy beaches attract surfers here from far and wide. Back in Georgia, there's a local pub surrounded by pretty cottages and on the edge of the village is house number one. So our first property here in North Devon, it is a converted barn and this is your property. Right. Okay. Interesting. Completely different to what I was expecting, but I can't wait to see inside now. Come on, Keith. You're looking at me. I know. It's attached. It is. And I'm wondering where the uh, acre or two is. This house has lots of merits. Let's step inside and hopefully all will be revealed. Excellent. Dating back 300 years, this barn originally belonged to the nearby farm. It was converted in 2004 by the current owners and has been tastefully renovated, so hopefully the style and space will measure up to expectation. So you've got a good hallway which leads to the kitchen. Nice kitchen. Not as wide as I would like it. It's Quite, lovely and yeah, modern, which bit, is what I do like. Yeah, it's, but it is a bit smaller than what we've actually got at the moment. Though. Right. Patio doors to your garden with that amazing view. Yeah. That is the main area to dine. Mm -hmm. The dining area is yeah. not big enough for us. Because our table was also at least twice the size of this the one we've got. Right. Size is an issue. Let's see what we make of next door. And do mind your head. Because this is your sitting room. Really nice lounge, but probably on a little bit on the small side for is us. It? It's a little bit darker in here than what I would like for a lounge, because I quite like big windows. Plenty of natural sunlight. A lot of the time, it is only going to be the two of you. Well, it is, but the only thing is, the intention of coming down here was to hopefully meet new friends and as Cameron doing her supper we club. We love entertaining, you know, yeah. yeah. So ideally, are we thinking inviting like 12 people around on a Saturday night? That would be normal for us. Yeah. Would it really? Yes. Yeah. All right. Well, it's good to know. Let's keep going. OK. Also on the ground floor of the sitting room, there's a small double bedroom with its own ensuite, which could be useful for visiting guests. With the downstairs covered, we're heading upstairs, where there are three further bedrooms. There's a potential double and one single, as well as a tiled family bathroom. I'm hoping the proportions up here will get the thumbs up as we inspect the largest bedroom. So here's our master bedroom with its own ensuite as well. oh, lovely. toilet and sink. This is a good size, yeah. And obviously the views out here. The views are excellent, yes. yeah. The balance in living space downstairs, I'm taking it, is mm. the priority, isn't it? it yeah. Is. And upstairs, you don't yeah. mind the bedrooms being a little bit smaller. No. I think the entertaining area is more important to us. OK, well, I'll let you explore the upstairs on your own. Let's head back downstairs. OK. Look at the garden. And also, you've got to start thinking about putting a price on our first property. <laughs> Outside the property and just off the courtyard, there are two good-sized garages. The rear garden benefits from a large paved area, ideal for outdoor entertaining, and the lawn gently slopes down towards open fields. This may be slightly smaller than Karen and Keith expected, but perhaps they'll be buoyed by a suggestion I have up my sleeve. It's a good size, but I think we're all going to agree it's not the acre that you'd set your heart on. Yes. What you do have, though, is the field behind us. But having spoken to the owners, the one option might be to see if you could rent the land. Mm -hmm. Nice garden, but it's going to be too small for us. We do spend a lot of time in the garden, yeah. even in the winter, because we've no. got, and we've got hot a lot, tub. Yeah, we've got a lot of garden yeah. furniture. And what is this about hot tubs? <laughs> Your eyes lit up then no. when you said it. <laughs> is this going to be the first thing that arrives oh, in the yes. garden? It, yeah, it will be, yeah. <laughs> OK, well, for the first time, our first property, let's see what price we're going to put on it. Who wants to go first? I would say 425. Keith? Uh, Beans it is attached, I would have probably thought 400. It has only just gone on the market, about two weeks. The asking price is £450,000. Now, are you okay. shocked by that? Yeah. Yeah, Beans it is attached, I would have thought that was a bit toppy. This is only the first house that you've actually seen here in Devon. I mean, sometimes it is a bit of a reality check, you know what your money will buy you, mm -hmm. certainly in an area like this. But well, I think it's worth another look. Anyway, oh, yes. okay. Have a browse and I'll catch up with you later. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. £25,000 under their maximum budget, this converted barn with a contemporary interior has four bedrooms and is set in a desirable edge of village location close to the coast. 
Although it hit the mark on style, it seems the space may have fallen short of their great entertaining ambitions. I think when I saw it, I was a little bit disappointed because uh, we'd asked for a detached and uh, obviously the first thing we noticed is that it was a courtyard setting and it was an attached building. I really like the house. I do like the fact that it's contemporary. My main concern is an entertainment area for the family. We've got grandchildren and we've got lots of friends that come round, so my priority is the downstairs areas. It's a very nice house, um, great location, really well decorated, but unfortunately a little bit too small for me. All right, you two, have you seen enough? Yeah, that's great, right, thank you. OK, well, that was our first property. Not a bad start. More to show you, shall we? Yeah. Hugging the dramatic North Devon coastline and drawing visitors from far and wide is the picture postcard fishing village of Clovelly. With cobbled streets and cottages that cascade down to the sea, it's a perfect snapshot of the county's preserved heritage. Three families have governed the village since the 13th century, and since 1878, the Hamlins have owned the estate. This means that all residents' properties are leasehold, however, with no holiday lets permitted, and tenants required to spend at least 200 days a year living here, there's an extremely tight-knit community. Karen and Keith are keen to find out more about the history of the county, so we've arranged for them to meet Clovelly tour guide Yana Edwards and residents Eli and Noah, whose ancestors were vital to daily life in the village. What do the donkeys do here in the village? Historically, they were absolutely crucial for bringing things mostly out of the village. Any heavy objects like fish or coal or limestone, they'd offload ships onto the donkeys and they'd take, take the goods, usually up to the top. How do people transport their goods nowadays? People use sleigh-like apparatus and they slide along the cobbles. You bring in your, all your worldly goods when you move into this village in a sledge. Everybody has their own personal little sledge for their own personal shopping. One of the most influential owners of Clovelly was Christine Hamlin, who inherited the estate in 1884 and was passionate about the restoration and preservation of the village. Its unique identity still endures today. There's a lot of different architectural styles in this village. Um, a lot of that had to do with Christine Hamlin. She would travel somewhere, she'd find some architectural style she really liked, and she'd come back and she would just apply it to whatever she was restoring. Mm. It's a really nice view from up here, and I can see there's a key down there. Is that still an active key? It's a very active key. It's active for different reasons, perhaps, now than it was. The harbour breakwater was built to encourage herring fishing back in the 16th century, which enabled Clovelly to become a thriving fishing port. However, 300 years later, when that industry was on the decline, Christine Hamlin turned her attention to encouraging tourism here. By the late 19th century, boats were ferrying two to 3,000 people a day across the Bristol Channel from Wales. Although tourism is now the main industry here, two fishing families still remain in Clovelly. Stephen Perham is a sixth-generation fisherman and is the current harbour master. How long have you been harbour master? About 12 years, just, just over 12 years now. Yeah? My cousin was harbour master just before me, and my, my father's been harbour master, my older brother's been harbour master, so it has been in the family you know, for quite a few years. It's just it's an honorary position, you're given it by the estate. It's a lovely place to live and work, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. What is your job as a harbour master? We get quite a few yachts coming here in the summer, you know, to make sure they're OK, and we allocate moorings, as well as looking after the fabric of the harbour wall. Has uh, tourism impacted on the fishing industry? In it's, it's a very small fishing industry yeah. now. There's only sort of three or four of us that, that fish commercially mm -hmm. all year round. In its heyday, there was over 80 fishing boats working from Clavelli, and many for the herring. And everybody in the village would have been associated with the herring in one way or another as well. Well, Steve, thanks for meeting us today. It's been really nice meeting you, and it's really nice to see uh, Clavelli from this side. Yeah, it's lovely, isn't it? Thank yeah, you yeah, for yeah, telling us all about it. That's no Thank problem you. at all. Karen and Keith seem inspired by their visit to this glorious corner of Devon, so let's hope our properties pique their interest too. Our second house takes us over the border into Somerset to the village of Brushford. Close by is Dulverton, a historic market town in the heart of the West Country and a popular base for visitors. 
as it's located on the southern edge of Exmoor National Park. Here, the River Barn is crossed by its Grade 1 listed bridge, which dates back to medieval times. The river is a protected site of special scientific interest on account of its wildlife. Dulverton offers a range of amenities catering for its tourists, and the surviving buildings reflect its textile manufacturing heritage. Situated three miles away and with views over the National Park is our next offering. So you're standing here thinking, well, which is the property? Mm -hmm. This one is our next house. It's nice. Yeah? Very nice. Yes. Yeah, I like that. So even though it looks like it's brand new, in actual fact, this used to be an old stables. What is it that appeals to you? Is it the local stone, slate roof? The big windows. Ah, <laughs> yes. Like Keith? That. I'm keeping an open mind till we've had a look inside. <laughs> OK. All right. Well, you know what? I'm not going to say anymore. Let's see what you think. Good. Should we Excellent. start the tour? Yeah. Definitely. Formerly stable blocks dating back to 1874, this property was later part of a purpose-built hotel established to accommodate the influx of Victorian visitors to the area. It was converted into a home three years ago with modern living in mind, so hopefully they'll be impressed by the space on offer for entertaining. Oh, this is really nice. Yeah, this is better. Exactly what I'd like. <laughs> That's really nice, that isn't it? That is really nice, yeah. So, is this what you're thinking yes, of as a sitting room? It's much more really nice, yeah. yeah. They've really tried nice. to keep as many of the features as they can, mm. but you still have that contemporary feel that you're after. It does. It wouldn't be a struggle to fit everybody in. You know, you've got the children running around, and, and it's bright, it's light, it's nice. Certainly a fantastic start. I think you're going to like what's next door. The all-important wow. kitchen. That's my perfect size kitchen. That's exactly what we want. Yeah, that's really nice. Yeah, Do, yeah definitely. Really nice. And you've got the bifold yeah. doors there as well, so plenty of light in here. Plenty of light, beautiful light. Huge dining table. How's it fit there? Number yeah. one stop for the supper club, this definitely. new hobby that you want. Absolutely, yeah. Really nice. So far? So far, so good. So good. <laughs> right, we'll head upstairs. Also on the ground floor at the other end of the sitting room is a second reception room, currently used as a study, which could be a playroom for the grandchildren. Making our way upstairs, the striking double-height stairwell and galleried landing exposes the original character of the property, which is flooded with natural light. There are four double bedrooms in total. Featuring exposed brickwork, the first is currently being used as a snug with its own ensuite. The second also benefits from an ensuite, and the third is neutrally decorated. This lies next to the family bathroom, which is also high spec and contemporary. I'm hoping the size and decor up here will keep those positive reactions flowing as we look at where they would sleep. So, this is your master bedroom with ensuite. This is really nice. It's a nice size, good size. Really good size, yeah. Yeah, even though it's got and sloping ceilings, it's yeah. really still a good size room. Definitely. Yes, I do, isn't it? And the views, beautiful yeah. views again. That's not too sad, is it? No, Wake up to a bit of view. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's going to be a hard act to follow. <laughs> well, Keith, you said to me in the car, you're the hard one to please. He nearly broke into a smile then, Karen. Did he? Yeah, easy. <laughs> <laughs> Don't be silly. Don't be silly. <laughs> sure. I'm going to cut while I'm ahead. Let's, let's take you outside. Hopefully that'll be the icing on the cake. <laughs> Outside the property, there's a carport and parking for four cars. At the back, the garden has two large sun terraces with steps down to an expansive lawn which looks out over open farmland. The patio, you could get ten hot tubs on there should you want to. One's enough. <laughs> <laughs> and then just over our shoulder on the right, that is the National Park. Do you like it? Really lovely. Amazing view, that is. That used to be a hotel mm -hmm. that has been converted. That was done in about 2002, so you do have neighbours. That would be a big concern to me. The house is absolutely lovely. The gardens, the gardens are great. Perfect. Don't mind not having an acre because it's so open, but to sit in your garden and be looking up at the, all them flats, I think that would be a deal breaker for me. Right. Well, let's see what you think of the actual price of the house. Our converted stable block. How much do you think the asking price is? I would have thought 495. Okay. I think it's going to be 500. The asking price is it is over your budget. It's 485,000 yeah. pounds. Wow. Yeah. 
The owners are aware of your top budget of 475, so they would happy to have a conversation with you. But obviously, if that wasn't next door, if perhaps that was a field or a meadow, you could be looking over £500,000 for that, I think. I would love you to have another look around, just the two of you. Okay. Check yeah, out all the bedrooms, mm -hmm. the finish. Be Thank my you. guest. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Nudging just over budget at £485,000, this 19th century former stable block provides four bedrooms and an exceptional quality interior. Its contemporary style and flow would provide them with the ideal living spaces they need in their new home. Overlooking Exmoor National Park, this property also gives them a great location just outside a village. Well, it's a good size room, isn't it? It's amazing. Really nice room. I love the house. The house is everything that I would want our house to be. The kitchen area, for, for my what I want to do, I want to entertain and you know, do a supper club. It would just suit everything I would like. I could certainly see myself living in the house, but uh, not where it's positioned. Being so overlooked would be an issue for me. You know, that's what we're trying to get away from. All right. I thought there was a good second there when I thought that was it. We'd done it. We'd cracked it with this house. You're so, so close. You just can't get over really being overlooked, close. can you? No, unfortunately, it's the people overlooking. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm not giving up because tomorrow we have our mystery house. We'll see how we get on with that. Looking forward to it. <laughs> yeah, good, come wait. on. <laughs> It's the second day of our house hunt in Devon with Keith and Karen from near Southend in Essex. Armed with a budget of £475,000, they'd like a property that will suit their sociable lifestyle. Coming up, our mystery house offers a vision of the country dream that takes their breath away. I don't think you could pick a better view, could you? No. It's really lovely. And I hope I don't lose my marbles as I turn my hand to creating a glass masterpiece. I think that's as far away from a circle as you could possibly get. It's more like a lozenge. So Karen and Keith, our fun-loving couple from Essex, are desperate for a new life here in Devon, but they haven't done an awful lot of research. So I think yesterday, our first day showing them around the county was a little bit of a reality check. They've got a healthy budget, but they also want quite a lot for their money. So today, with the Mystery House, I'm feeling more confident. They love entertaining, and with this property, I think it could have all the answers they're looking for. For our mystery property, we're heading back into Devon to the quiet village of Blackborough. Nearby is the village of Kentisbeer, set in the lower Calm Valley. Here, charming whitewashed thatches line the winding country lanes, and right in the centre is a local store with post office and grade two listed pub. Back in Blackborough, on the edge of the Blackdown Hills in the heart of the village, is our super modern mystery house. So our final property is, of course, the mystery house, and here it is. It looks quite big. Hopefully it'll be big inside. Different. It is different, yeah. This is one of the original kit houses that came over by Laurie from Scandinavia around 1995. I'll reserve judgment to have had a look inside. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fall. Well, come on, now, be honest. Tell me what's going through your mind, because reserving judgment doesn't help us work out what you're thinking. <laughs> or is it you've got nothing to say? Go on, tell me. It's you can... uh, busy round here. OK. It's hard to judge from the outside. OK. All right, well, let's see if the mystery can win you over inside. Thank let's you. Have a look. Our 20th century mystery house majors on delivering excellent thermal insulation and energy efficiency, so it's extremely economical to run. However, it does throw down the gauntlet of upside down living, which could challenge their conventional mindset. This is an upside down house. It's nicely open plan. Yes, they're very nice. Beautiful views, yeah. amazing views. So you've got this wonderful living space maximising that vista. Yeah, it's a good sized lounge, so the space is good. Yeah. Have either of you ever lived in a property that's topsy turvy? As they no. Say? no. It keeps quite a traditionist. He likes sleeping upstairs. <laughs> I like going up to bed. Yeah. You're both itching to get out on that balcony, aren't yes. you? Come on. <laughs> I think we should.
Built to benefit from its elevated position on a clear day, views here can stretch as far as Dartmoor, 40 miles away. You know, appreciate we do have neighbours either side, but these are the type of views that you see. These are amazing, absolutely amazing. I don't think you could pick a better view, could you? No. It is really lovely. I'm really glad to see that you've got us a lake and also probably a couple <laughs> of acres. <laughs> Well, we'll go into that in a little bit more detail when we go into the garden. But we're going to continue with the house. I'm going to take you away from that view. Keith, if you wouldn't mind leading the way back into the property, turn left because we're going to take a look at the kitchen. So here we have our kitchen. As you can see, it's got a dining table in it. Um, it's ready for a little bit of love yeah. and a refit. Yeah, I would probably change the layout as well, would you? Yeah. yeah. It's not very sociable if I'm cooking and we've got no. people around and they're sitting through there. No, and, this would probably you know. be too small, wouldn't it? Well, I'm not going to give up with our mystery house. I'm going to take you downstairs because that's where the bedrooms are. Excellent. Okay. Down on the ground floor, there are a total of four bedrooms. A compact double and a good-sized single are currently children's rooms. There's also a further snug single, a neutrally decorated family bathroom and a handy utility room but we're heading for the master. And it's a good-sized bedroom. Yeah, and obviously excellent That's views really as well. lovely. I yeah. mean, sit in bed for your cup of tea looking out there would be perfect. Really lovely and bright in here. Yeah. I like I like that idea of the of the big windows with your own balcony, access to the garden. Good size ensuite next door. Yes. What do you think? I've still got this thing about privacy. And the garden finishes there. I assume that people go out there to the land and the pond, and they haven't got the privacy. I do understand what you mean about privacy. Let's go into the garden, and then you okay. can see it in all its glory and make that decision. Excellent. Okay. Having explored the quirky interior layout of our mystery house, it's time to explore outside. To the rear of the property, there's access to storage beneath the house, and with long-reaching views over the Blackdown Hills, the garden has a decking area, ideal for entertaining outdoors. There's also a shepherd's hut, which might prove to be a hit with the grandchildren. Karen seems to be embracing the merits of this property more than Keith, but hopefully what's on offer out here will give them a fresh perspective. It looks more modern and it looks bigger from yeah. here than it does the front, I think. Anything else you more spotted, character. Keith? Uh, I've spotted a hot tub. <laughs> At last we found one. <laughs> what is it about hot tubs that you two love so much? I think, well, where we are, we's, ours is really private and everything. I'd imagine if you sit in that one, you could actually wave at the people in the field and, you know, <laughs> and the lake. As, Who you know. do you think is going to be in that field? <laughs> not at the time of night we're <laughs> Sadly, you don't own the field. No. But if you wanted to, there could be possibility of actually buying it or renting it. But how much do you think this is on the market for? I would say 450 No, I'd say less than that. I would have probably thought 14 OK, but the asking price is £435,000. Would that tempt you? No. Still not. <laughs> no. no, not because of, you know, it's not the money issue. It's, uh, it's just not the house it, for it's you. It's just not the it's house, just for, not us. The house yeah. for us. No. Yeah. Um, I'm going to send you back in so you can reacquaint yourself with the property. But before you do that, I think you should take a look in the shepherd hut there. That is a keeper. <laughs> it's such fun. Go and have a look. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. £40,000 under budget, our contemporary mystery house is configured so that the four bedrooms and living areas make the most of those stunning countryside views. It's also in a central village location. Oh, this is really lovely. This is different, isn't it? The grandchildren would love this. They'd think this is there. Yeah, it'd be ideal, wouldn't it? They stayed the night and a lovely sleepover. Yeah. I was quite surprised at the mystery house. It has got a well factor to it, but the kitchen doesn't flow with the dining room and then the garden. They're all separated. I don't think it's quite the house for us. Very nice lounge, absolutely amazing views. A um, little bit disappointed with the lack of garden again. It has made me realise that probably we need to spend more money to get what we want. Well, that's it. You've seen all our properties now, including, of course, the mystery house. I think it's been... Well, an interesting few days. Very, Very interesting. interesting, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Mm. We now need a proper chat, don't we? I want to hear your thoughts. OK. Everyone.
Although Devon is well known for its striking coastlines, beautiful rolling hills and national parks, it also has a rich industrial heritage. One industry that prospered for over 160 years was pottery production, which took advantage of the natural abundance of clay in the county. Potteries grow up all over the region, and although the kilns under these chimneys are no longer fired to create earthenware, traditional skills are still in use. I've come to meet Andrea Harkin from Teen Valley Glass to find out more about the ancient art of glass sculpting. Andrea, good to meet you. Hello there. Now, when you think of Devon, well, certainly for me, I think of agriculture, tourism, beautiful countryside, arts and crafts, but not pottery. No, the Boffy Tracy Pottery Company was based here at around 1843, and it did employ about 300 people. Unfortunately, in around 1957, it went bankrupt due to changing markets, and so it was left to ruin. So how did you find your company here? Well, we were making glass and toys and games just down the road. We expanded and we moved to this site in 1990. The business originally began as a games manufacturer producing solitaire boards. However, they quickly moved on to producing their own artisan marbles. So in 1981, they opened their own glassworks. This is an extraordinary studio. It's like an Aladdin's cave. Now, one thing that has caught my eye is this. Now, that is like a work of art in itself, isn't it? Is. it? These are all handmade using traditional techniques that have been passed down through generations and generations of craftsmen. This is craftsmanship, isn't it, at its best? Everyone is an individual piece. Yes. Well, I've fallen in love with this little marble. How easy would it be for me to recreate something like this? You're welcome to have a go. Let's see how I get on. Andrew, yes. thank you very much. Thank you. Coloured glass marbles are thought to date back to as early as the 15th century in Venice. Glass workers used to gather up remnants off the factory floor and roll them into little balls to take home for their children. The Victorians went on to master techniques used for making marbles that are still used today. Senior glass maker Matt Sharp has been sculpting glass for 16 years, so I'm hoping he thinks I can cut it. How long would it take you to make something like this? Uh, probably about six, seven minutes to make one of those. What's the first step? Right, we've got to take the gather of glass out of the furnace, which is over here. How hot is it in there? Uh, it's uh, 1,100 degrees. So all I'm doing now is just putting the rod into the glass, giving it a few turns, then coming back out. So if yep. you keep turning all the time, then what we're going to do, we're going to start rolling it in the white first. Just keep giving it a dusting? Yep. Enough? Yeah. now we need to go into the grill and warm it up. And the heat in this furnace, similar or less? Uh, it's a little bit more. This is about 1250. I mean, I can feel it on my face. Now we can come out and add some more colour. Keep turning. Yep. Is that enough? Yep, that's lovely. Okay. Back in? Yep, so back in and melt the colour in again. Okay. Next, some small plates of iridescent glass called dichroic are added to the softened surface. The glass is then heated again to make it more malleable so it can be rolled on a metal plate to smooth out irregularities. Now that looks like an interesting suite at the moment, doesn't it? Yes. A further layer of clear glass is added to the outside to seal the colour inside, and it's rolled again. And you're just getting used to shaping the glass. You can push a little bit harder now. It's more like a lozenge. Tools called jacks are then used to squeeze the centre of the glass to form the beginning of a marble before it's blasted once more in the furnace. And then what we do is put it in there and we start spinning it and hopefully it will start to make a round shape. This is well so done. difficult and you make it look so lots and easy. Lots of but look at that, it's transforming in front of my eyes. Okay, the brilliant. Colour. We're just about there now. The final part of sculpting a marble is to separate the rounded end from the rest of the glass. And when we knock it off from the line, there'll be a little sharp rough patch on the top. And that was so off, delicate. Knock it off like that. And then with our little torch here, we just try and melt that top in and make it as round as we can. So we've got to have a nice even heat around the marble just to try and make it back round again. I'm really pleased with that. Am I able to take it? Uh, no, because uh, we've got to cool it down now. So we've got to pop it into one of our kilns for about 15, 16 hours. Because if we don't do that, it will shatter. Matt, I am delighted with that end result. I think you helped me far more than you were probably meant to. But it looks perfect. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you. It's been a fascinating insight into the process of glassmaking and heartening to see skilled sculptors like Matt continuing to champion Devon's craft heritage. 
This has been a tough few days. We have struggled. Not with Keith and Karen. No, they've been very complimentary about all the properties we've shown them, but for what they're after on their budget, it's proved so hard to find. Now, interestingly enough, they've made a few comments and observations, especially after the mystery house. So I'm keen to hear what their conclusion is. Karen and Keith, well, we started off with a clean slate, desperate to leave Essex, new life in Devon. Mm -hmm. But finding you that perfect property has been well, it's quite elusive for us, hasn't it? Yeah, I think so. It hasn't quite met, you know, our criteria in as far as size of the buildings, you know, and land, and you know, which is what we're looking for. But we did get very close with our second property, just over the border in Somerset, tantalisingly close. Very yeah. close. Yeah, it was ninety percent there. Ninety-eight percent there. Yeah, the house. Pretty close. <laughs> Perfect. You adored the view. And then we had a few neighbours next door, didn't we? Yeah. You like entertaining. You can invite them all over for your supper. He likes clubs. entertaining. Yeah. He doesn't like being overlooked. <laughs> <laughs> so on reflection, now you've seen some housing stock, do you think you can get what you want on your budget in this particular area? I think the properties are available in that bracket. Yeah. But then we've got to make compromises. Well, I think if we can adjust it maybe 50, another £75,000 more, we will probably get what we're looking for. Well, for us, it's long term, so it's worth spending that little bit of extra money. Is it possible, do you think, to find an extra £75,000? Yeah, yeah, it will be possible, yeah. Hopefully, you will find that dream home. It is out there. We've given you a taste. Mm -hmm. A little bit more exploring, you might find it. I'm sure we will. Sure we will. Yeah. Let us know, though, won't you? We, we will. certainly will, yeah. Wonderful. The party house, that's what I'm going to name <laughs> it. Thank you both so much. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I think that was a fair assessment of the situation from Karen and Keith there, and they've come up with the conclusion that if they are going to find that beautiful, entertaining party house that they're so after with the grounds and the privacy they crave, they are going to have to dig just that little bit deeper. In all honesty, I'm delighted that they came to that conclusion that I didn't suggest they had to find more money, but I think that's the perfect answer. We wish them all the best. And that's it from me from wonderful Devon. I'll catch you again on Escape to the Country. After the reality check of what they could get for their money, Karen and Keith have decided to raise their budget and are continuing to scour the county in a bid to find their ideal country home. If you would like to escape to the country in England, Wales, Scotland or Northern Ireland and need our help, please apply online at bbc.co.uk forward slash be on a show. Today's buyers are excited about returning to their roots and embracing a rural life back in the UK. Our couple question whether they've moved to the right country. These cupboards are looking decidedly French. <laughs> <laughs> Even to the home. cooker hood, yeah. But are then pleasantly surprised when our properties render one half of our duo speechless. Quiet is good. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, Helen will soon tell you if she doesn't like it. <laughs> <laughs> Today I'm in North Wales and this is Lake Bala, or to give it its Welsh name, Clyn Tegith, which means the Lake of Serenity. Now despite the name, locals say that the lake, which is four miles long and a mile wide, is home to a very retiring monster that they call, appropriately, Teggy. Now we don't know about the monster's whereabouts, but we do know that this is the only lake in Wales that is home to a very rare species of fish called the Gwyniad, which has been living here since the Ice Age. And you can guess with views and landscape like this that human inhabitants have always chosen to live here too, at least for the last 10,000 years. North Wales is made up of six counties, including Denbyshire and Flintshire. Covering some 800 square miles of the region is the Snowdonia National Park, which is home to the highest peak in England and Wales, Mount Snowdon. On the southern edge of the famous mountain range and perched on the edge of the River Malvach, is the beautiful hamlet of Penmine Pool. In 1879, a wooden toll bridge spanning the picturesque estuary was erected. Now costing just 20 pence for pedestrians and 60 pence for cars to cross, this Grade II listed structure is also a popular spot for bird watching. 
Out towards the northern coast, at Conwy, is one of the country's 600 castles. Commissioned by Edward I during the 13th century, it was a key fortress in his iron ring of castles, strategically situated high above the river Conwy, and certainly remains one of Wales' most magnificent castles. Inland market towns include Rhythin, which boasts the oldest timbered townhouse in the country, which was constructed around 1435 to house weavers' merchants. With its enticing mix of historic architecture and vast unspoilt scenery, cut by some of the most dramatic waterfalls in the UK, this region really does make the ideal backdrop for those looking to get away from it all. Bricks and mortar are good value in Wales. The average price for a detached house here is £170,000, which is a whopping £100,000 less than the national figure. So your property pound goes a lot further, particularly when you consider if you cross the border over into Shropshire, the same sort of house might cost you £70,000 more. So apart from good value and beautiful countryside, what else is attracting our buyers here this week? Marketing manager Robin and his wife Helen are visiting Wales for a week and are staying at a hotel in Rhythin whilst they search for a new home. They met at a mutual friend's barbecue in 2001 and during their early married years Robin was offered a relocation package which took them from Workingham in Surrey to overseas. So for the last 12 years they've been living in Normandy, northwest France. We had a, an opportunity to have a complete lifestyle change. And Helen was able to live at home and have animals at home and be a housewife and, and do what she always wanted to do. And we arrived in France saying, wow, what have we done? And that was it, <laughs> it was the start of a new adventure. Yeah. That um, the children are at a point where they're getting ready to leave home. So we think it's now an ideal time for us to make a move and do something different with the rest of our lives. Two of their three daughters are already finishing higher education in the UK. Furthermore, although our couple have tried their best to learn French in a bid to integrate with the locals, they are far from fluent. There are other elements of daily life that remain a bugbear. Everything shuts at 12 for two hours. <laughs> the supermarkets, the banks, all the shops. And it's, you always run out of things at t just five past 12. <laughs> They've also come to the conclusion that video calling close relatives based in the UK just doesn't compare to face-to-face -face contact. The thing we miss the most is, is our friends and our family. It's not as easy to see them and catch up with them. And our parents are getting older, they can't travel to France so much. So easier for <coughs> us to see them and them to see us. Excited about exploring a new location, which still gives them the countryside they've enjoyed in France, but with less language issues, they've decided to return and settle in North Wales. It's lovely and green. And when the weather's nice here, it's beautiful. One thing we'd like to do is discover more about Wales, more about its history, its heritage, yes. come and look at some of the major landmarks. Um, we're both interested in old houses, castles, that type of thing. Since Helen no longer has to run around after their daughters, she's looking forward to following more green-fingered pursuits, particularly the possibility of growing plants for medicinal purposes. Whilst I've been in France, I have been studying herbalism. I really want to pursue that more and give more time to that. As well as horticulture, their new Welsh home also needs land that's suitable for their three dogs, as well as the ducks and chickens they're hoping to continue keeping. They're also keen to introduce eco-friendly measures which they already have in France. We have a well in the garden, which we extract water from via a pump, which is used for watering the garden, and we harvest the rainwater from the house. And that goes into the pond, which is used by the ducks. With their beautiful French farmhouse already on the market, it's au revoir to France and hello, or perhaps more appropriately, Borada to Wales. We're not running away from France, we're not escaping from France back to the UK. It's a new adventure, it's a new area, it's new people. It's now our time to go and do things as a couple and actually think, OK, this is what we want to do for the next you know, 20 years before we retire. Robin and Helen are fairly unfamiliar with the countryside of North Wales and are therefore flexible about where they move to. Not only am I eager to welcome them back and find out exactly what they want from their new home, I'm also itching to practice my French.
Bonjour. Bonjour. Welcome to Wales, Pays de Gaulle. <laughs> How are you feeling being back in the homeland? Very good, very good. Nice. It's nice, nice to be back. Nice English weather you've brought with you. Yes, <laughs> just the same. <laughs> and I know that you've struggled a bit with French. How is your Welsh? Absolutely non-existent, <laughs> but I can say Borida. Oh, very good. Well, yeah. that'll come in handy. Yeah, and I've learned that recently, <laughs> yes. And Robin, what are you looking for in terms of the house? So ideally we're looking for a four-bedroom property with up to an acre of land. We'd like the new property maybe to include some eco features or the ability to incorporate those later on. So we're thinking more along the lines of solar power, maybe ground source heat pump system, something just to be a little bit more greener. What will you use the four bedrooms for? The four bedrooms will give you a larger footprint downstairs, which is where obviously we spend most time. It will give the ability for Robin to have an office as well and, and possibly me also to have my own area. And you want an acre of land, that's quite a lot of land. What are you going to do with that? Um, personally, I like a nice big workshop and garage. We both like outdoor space. Helen loves her garden. I want to grow some herbs and um, have a, a wild area as well. And in terms of location, do you want to be sort of in a village, out in the middle of nowhere? On the edge of a village, somewhere that we can maybe join in with the, with the community, yeah. but, but be far enough away to be, to be rural. And in terms of the style, are you looking for an old building, new? Tell me about that. Not a new build. Really anything with character. But you also want sort of modern because you want the eco features. No, because the eco features can be external. And remind us again of your budget. So £400,000. And within that, we like to include some of the eco features if possible. Your money goes quite a long way in terms of property in France. I mean, have you got a massive estate? Six bedrooms. So we're downsizing, in effect. And before it starts to rain, let's get in the car <laughs> and go. Follow me. With a budget of £400,000 to play with, our buyers are after a character property with four bedrooms. Robin would like a workshop, whilst Helen requires an acre of land to grow herbs. Ideally, they'd also like their new property to feature elements that are eco-friendly. We've hunted high and low to track down some beautiful Welsh properties in stunning settings, which I hope will appeal to our couple but the price will be held back until each house tour is over. Our final effort is the rather challenging mystery option, where proportions and plot present an alternative arrangement to their ideal Welsh retreat. So imagine that you've got your house, you've moved in. What are the things that you're most looking forward to being able to go and do? You quite like going to the WI, wouldn't you? Quite like the sound of that. Quite like the sound of that. Helen makes a lot of jams and chutneys. Robin, you probably join a four by four club. Yeah, I mean, the, I have a couple of older ones. I'm one I'm currently restoring on. One's waiting to be restored. And maybe we'll find a new hobby together. Yeah, that would be yes. great. <laughs> <laughs> We're beginning our search on the Welsh Shropshire border and heading to the hamlet of Pentracoid. Nearby is the traditional market town of Ellesmere where a mix of Tudor, Georgian and Victorian buildings sit alongside a scattering of small craft and antique stores. The high street is a hive of activity with a wealth of everyday amenities and a variety of eateries, ranging from quaint tea rooms to 16th century pubs. Just over three miles away, situated down a quiet lane and with far-reaching views over the Welsh landscape, is house number one. And this is the first property. It's an unusual property because it's actually a converted barn. And then there's this sort of outbuilding which is converted into another dwelling here. So it's sort of two. Lovely. OK, yes. Very nice. It's very quiet. Nice it's and very, peaceful. Yes. Very warm kind yes. of feel to it. Yes. It looks very new. Well, it actually dates back to 1807 as the original uh, Not barn. Not so new, then. <laughs> 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 I'd be interested to see inside. Yeah, let's go in here. OK. This 19th century barn, converted around 15 years ago, previously formed part of a pentracoid farm. Sympathetically renovated, original character features are apparent on all three levels of accommodation. With conservative reactions outside, I'm hoping that the interior might just conjure up some comparisons to our couple's current home. These cupboards are looking decidedly French. <laughs> <laughs> kind of Even to the home. cooker hood, yes. <laughs> yeah. So, Space yeah. for a table's good, though. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. It's a little smaller than I'd thought. But then again, it's only mainly going to be the two of us going forward. This is it. So and we are downsizing. And we are downsizing. We are downsizing yeah. So, yeah. as that is. Yes. You've got the utility room there with the kind of white goods and the kind of fridge and also okay. kind of a 
a downstairs loo and a shower, in fact. Downstairs shower, great for dogs. Put them straight it's into the shower and wash them off. So. Uh -huh. Excellent. And also just point out that there is a dining room as well, so yes. this is not your only eating space. OK, good. I have a feeling that Helen is a little unconvinced. The main living room is located on the first floor and provides more character, so perhaps she'll be taken with the beamed ceiling. Mind your head. So the beams get a little bit yes. lower on the second yes. floor. That is quite um, intimidating, be, uh... actually. <laughs> and that, I think, was going to become a real issue because mm -hmm. it's right in everybody's line of vision as well and it sort of divides the room up. That'll be a first for us, having to duck our heads. A bit, uh, nice outlook to the garden through the window. So yes. That's nice. Good. It's nice, but it's small. Yeah, it feels small. And maybe that's something small. we have to come to terms with. Things have changed over the last 12 years since we've been away. Mm. And we have to be a little bit more realistic. Has it all shrunk? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you've got this sitting room here, and then over there you've got a study come bedroom. Right, OK. Let's go upstairs. That's where the master bedroom is. OK. Robin seems to be open to what's on offer, but Helen is proving to be a tougher cookie than I first thought. I'm not giving up, though, as there's plenty more to impress them. Up in the eaves, there is a modest family bathroom, which is shared by two well-presented and comfortable double bedrooms. We're stopping off at the largest of the bedrooms, which benefits from the height of the original wooden A-frame of the barn's structure. Space opens up here, up in the eaves. It's nice. Yeah, this, uh, is, this is fine. This is all right. Nice it's the, the, the low the door beach. again. Yes, that will be tricky, I think. It would uh, if you get up in take a while to get acclimatised to that. It's a nice room, but it's just it's something not there. Something's the missing. The doorway's the doorway. done it. Mm, yeah. Let's look at the uh, the modern extension and see if that has sure. higher doors. We don't appear to have made much headway, as the property doesn't seem to be tugging at their hearts. But I've got one more shot at winning them over. Back outside, and with its own entrance is a detached garage, which could be useful for storing Robin's 4x4 vehicles. Above the garage, there's a large, flexible living space, which was converted by the current owners nine years ago. Yeah, this is nice. It's lovely, yeah. yes. Nice headroom. This could be your office. Yeah. Small commute. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> We're not too far to go and fetch cups of tea for each other. Exactly. So that would be good. Exactly. Well, there is a washroom and shower downstairs. I mean, you could make it into a bedroom if you wanted. It's possible. Maybe yes. if one of the children came back, yes. they'd have to move our office, but... We'll put a sofa bed up here. Let's take a look at the outside space, because that's the one thing we haven't discussed. Okay. Thank goodness for that. Some positive reactions at last. Finally, it's time to explore the garden, which is located at the front and to the side of the property. Mostly lawn with established borders, this quiet rural setting is surrounded by uninterrupted country views. It's not quite the acre Robin and Helen were after. However, the adjacent field could provide a solution. So land. This property only has a third of an acre. It's pretty much this lawned area is right, your garden. Okay. This paddock doesn't belong to you. <sighs> but it would be available to rent. Oh, yes. yeah. excellent. It belongs to basically to the farmer next door. Yes, and I, as you yes. can see, they don't have anything on it. Yeah. The other part of the puzzle is the price. Mm, yes. Yes. So what do you think this property is on? Wow. I would go in at £365,000. I'd probably say £375. But you're actually smack bang in the middle of those. It's £5 short of £370. Wow. Right. OK. It's so, yes, very good effort. value, yes. Yes. So um, have a look around. Take your time to explore. And I'll see you later. OK. okay. £30,000 below the top budget, this converted barn with a host of charming character features has three bedrooms, Situated in a rural setting, on paper, it has pretty much all the elements that our couple are after. And they would still be left with money in their pocket to install eco features. It's uh, obviously a lovely home. It's got an ideal with the outbuilding, with the garage, with the living accommodation above. It's been restored to a very good standard. The only issue really I have is the, is the low ceilings. Location and setting-wise, I, I don't think we could have asked for anything more. I'm just not, not sold on the second floor of the house. Good, you're, you haven't crowned yourself on one of those low beams. No, not at all. OK, so that's this one all done and dusted. Let's head on, on to the next, next one. When they make their move to Wales, our buyers are keen to lead a more sustainable lifestyle. And they'll be in good company, as the country is home to Europe's leading eco-centre on the site of the disused Cluin Guern slate quarry in the Snowdonia National Park. Originally built in 1973, 
the Centre for Alternative Technology, known as CAT, now attracts over 65,000 visitors every year. And we've arranged for Robin and Helen to meet communications officer Kim Bryan to get some green ideas for their prospective new home. So what is CAT's ultimate aim? I think what we're trying to do is inform, inspire and enable people towards practical solutions for sustainable living. And that can be somebody that comes here and wants to go home and build themselves a straw bale house and install solar panels on their roof. Or it could be someone that comes here and just goes home and wants to change their light bulb. So what are the features here that help people live a more sustainable lifestyle? Well, we've got the wonderful organic gardens, which are demonstrations of how you can grow vegetables and flowers and the importance of biodiversity in the garden. We've got examples of renewable energy. We've got hydro, wind and solar and we've also got examples of sustainable buildings around the site. So what kind of things could we do to make our house more sustainable? Insulation, insulate your walls, insulate your floor, insulate your roof because that's where we lose so much of our energy. The other thing is energy efficiency, so that's the type of appliances that you buy, be it your washing machine, your tumble dryer, and making sure they've got a triple A rating. There's lots of little, little things that you can do around the house that can make a real difference. As well as advice on how to make our homes more energy efficient, the centre offers lots of practical courses teaching sustainable skills such as rustic furniture making and traditional timber framing. Our buyers have been invited to join today's course on straw baling with expert B. Rowan who has been teaching this technique around the world for about 18 years. Where do you get the straw from? Local materials, local straw. We always encourage people to develop a good relationship with their local farmer. And as long as the bales are nice and dense, they're uniform length and they're kept dry, you can build with them. So now to be a straw bale builder, one of the first things you need to know how to do is to split a bale. Because if you imagine we're going to be using them as big bricks, uh, we need whole bricks and half bricks. So let's go and split okay. a bale. Straw as a building material has been used for many thousands of years. However, straw bale construction was greatly facilitated by the mechanical hay baler, which was invented in the 1850s. Pursley B uses garden twine to mark the centre of the bale before it is then threaded through a giant needle. The string going around the right side through the top hole from the right and the one going around the left through the bottom hole from the left. It's then inserted through the middle of the bale. Robin, would you like to go around and just hold that bale for me? Steady that while I take this needle through. It is dense. It is very dense, isn't it? Very nice, dense building bale. Straw bales are perfect for load-bearing, as well as infill and insulation. Taking the string through the centre and then tying it around the outside helps each new half bale to retain its form. Helen, you're a natural. And I'll do the same here. The original strings left by the baling machine are then cut. So this is where it gets interesting. Are you ready? That's it. Separate those out, and if you've gone through, uh, let's pop those up. There we have our two wonderful new half bales. So you now have your straw bale building badge. Stage one. <laughs> Thank you. Using straw to build is a low cost and low impact option, but its simplicity doesn't compromise on quality. This means it's making a comeback, even in the building of modern properties. So with some green ideas under their belt, let's hope we can find Helen and Robin their perfect home where they can put some of them to good use. Our second offering takes us further into Wales to the county of Denbyshire and the rural hamlet of Saron. Close by is the town of Denby. With more listed buildings than any other in Wales, the town has been home to princes and earls rebels and revolutionaries who have shaped the local architecture. For nine centuries, the castle walls have protected the town, where there is a fine selection of independent shops, cafes, pubs and restaurants. Just over five miles away and nestled within a valley in the foot of the Cluidian Hills is our next property. I wanted to bring you here partly because this is your paddock. Right. And this, should you accept the challenge, is your house and view. Wow. Wow. That is fantastic. <laughs> Absolutely fantastic. fantastic. Yes. It's a lovely view. Yes, thank you. Very we'll nice. we'll thank take you. it. <laughs> it's pretty special, isn't it? Yes, gorgeous. Yeah. Yes. And a solar panel already. Ah, so uh, yes. starting off with the eco in the... Uh, the green the is yeah. already yes. noticed. What you're looking at is a, it's an old Welsh longhouse. So sort of that long ridge to the left 
is the longhouse. And then there was a barn to the front that had been joined into one. It goes right back to the beginning of the 18th century, so 1717. Mm -hmm. shall, we, uh, shall we venture down? We should. Yes, please. Yes. Uh -huh. yeah, that's right. As an unconventional house, the accommodation is on various levels and was extended by the current owners to incorporate a converted barn in 2008. So it presents our couple with a quirky blend of old and new features. Given their reactions outside, let's see what they make of the interior as we head to the historic heart of the house. And this is the kitchen. And you see these fantastic kind of stone flagstones. Written on the beam there, you can see 1717. This is lovely. It's a beautiful kitchen. How does it grab you for size? For size, it's good. It just seems to be spacious. This side of the house is really heated by the range cooker there and by a big log burner. OK. The other side of the house is underfloor heated by ground exchange system. Wow, fantastic. So, um, you Great. know that, and that is what you're looking for. Yes, indeed. Yes. Does this give us a thumbs up? It, it does. certainly does. Yes. So, so this is the older part of the house. Yes. Let's look at the new part. On the ground floor, the oldest part lies in one wing of the property. As well as the kitchen, which we have just seen, there's also a utility room, a sitting room, and two bedrooms. One is an attractive guest room, and the sitting room features a wood burner. But we're going to explore the main living room in the more recent wing of the property, which is slightly elevated and so maximises those views across the valley. This side of the house is a real change of gear, much more modern. Very nice. Lots of light, mm. windows. Looks like a balcony outside as well. You've got a fantastically huge sort of dining area, roof terrace, and then a smaller sort of little balcony here, which looks right over the Cluidian Hills and the rising sun. What are you thinking, Helen? Just, 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 just quiet. taking it in. Taking it in. Mm -hmm. Is that a good sign? I can't yes. quite read her body language. No, no, no. It's, it's a good sign. <laughs> OK, good. It's a good sign, yes. Good. Quiet is good. Yes. <laughs> well, Helen will soon tell you if she doesn't like something. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is the sort of the area here. You've got another office next door, but actually your sleeping accommodation is underneath. All right. Well, what a difference a house makes. And there's still more to see. Downstairs, but still within the newer part of the property, there's a kitchenette and two good-sized double bedrooms. One of these is currently used as a gym and has its own ensuite, with the added bonus of a sauna. But as tempting as that may sound, we're heading to the master. It's a house that just keeps on giving. <laughs> it is. Fancy waking up in the morning and just looking at the... You wouldn't draw the curtains, really, would you? It's a lovely view. And this part could be a completely self-contained area. Excellent. It's fantastic. I mean, the house is unusual, it's quirky in its layout, but uh, it's uh, certainly uh, very special. Very good. Well, I am going to drag you out, confusingly, out into the garden now to give you the price. Right. And, and to have a look at these lovely grounds. Outside and to the front of the property, there's a huge workshop, ideal for Robin in particular, as it can be accessed from the house. Then, for Helen, the extensive grounds here amount to four acres and include three separate paddocks which surround the property. Set within the ornamental gardens is a vegetable patch, a variety of fruit trees and a duck pond. I suspect these beautiful gardens surrounded by all this land might just be the icing on the cake. Chickens, ducks, ducks. and a cat. Aww. And a cat. What more could you want? That's right. So it's a substantial property. What do you think it's on the market for? It's definitely over our budget. So I would say £410,000. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go even higher. I'm going to say as much as £440,000. Oh, they wouldn't be that cruel, would they? <laughs> would they? <laughs> You'd be surprised. Um, well, uh, once again, between you, you're pretty accurate. Uh, we are a little cruel in the sense that it is officially on the market for £425,000. But we have spoken to the owner and he has said that he would take an offer at your top budget of 400. Wow. Wow. That seems incredible for the for quantity of land and for the size of the property yes. and with all the eco features already installed. Well, go and yeah. explore and then I'll, I'll meet you at the front once you've got your bearings. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. And you? <laughs> yes, come back to me. What do you think, Pussy? Eh? Should they buy it? Meow. Meow. Just over the maximum budget at £425,000, but with the owner open to negotiation, this extended Welsh longhouse combines a mix of traditional and modernised character features. 
With eco measures already in place and four acres of land set within an idyllic rural location, this property appears to suit our couple down to the ground. It's a fantastic location. We are in lovely countryside here. It's nice and quiet and peaceful. The bonus, I think, is the eco features that already come with the house. Really spectacular. This is a, a very big contender. So that's one's all done for the day. Got a little time to digest it. And then we'll regroup for tomorrow. Excellent. Thank you. It's day two of our property search with Helen and Robin, who, after 12 years living in Normandy, France, want to help themselves to a slice of country life by moving to North Wales. Coming up, our mystery property leads our couple to have a change of heart when it comes to character features. No exposed uh, stonework or beams. So is the no exposed stonework a good thing? Oh, yes. And I head to Clandidno to take a tram trip down memory lane and admire some of the best views in Wales. As you can see, the town now opening up behind you. Oh, and the bay, look. Yes, beautiful. Day two of our property search amongst the wonders of Wales, and I think we've probably got Helen and Robin hook, line and sinker with the house yesterday. But they do have to sell their property in France, of course, and we've got the mystery house yet to come. Now, this is a much more compact, much more simple and beautiful property, but will it be enough to dislodge house number two from yesterday? Let's find out. For our mystery option, we're remaining in Denbyshire and travelling to the tiny hamlet of Bontneuith. Nearby is the city of St Asaph, where, set on the banks of the River Elwy, is the smallest cathedral in Britain, an important spiritual centre since 560 AD. Today, the bustling high street features an array of shops and cafes, as well as arts and craft galleries. Located just over three miles downstream and sitting neatly in a river valley is our mystery property. For a couple who have lived in a large French farmhouse, I couldn't resist showing them something with historic Welsh roots as well as modern style. But the compromise here is on the dimensions inside and the gradient outside, with not an eco feature in sight. This is the first time I've showed you a property that's actually in amongst other properties. It's nice to feel that we've got immediate neighbours that you can uh, talk to and learn a little bit about the area and uh, go to for help sometimes if, uh, if you have a problem and you don't know how to resolve it. So the River Elwy here and then this is the Mystery House. Oh, wow. It's about 200 years old and the present owners have spent 25 years <laughs> remodelling it in wow. this incredibly, almost zen-like perfection. It ah. does look very, very quaint. It does. And Fantastic. Beautiful. Can't wait to see Beautiful. inside. Yes. And so follow me. Constructed during the early 19th century, this property, built from locally sourced stone and slate, was formerly two cottages. The mystery house is the smallest of all the properties we've shown Robin and Helen in a bit to challenge their mindset on the amount of space they're after from their new home. Although small, it's perfectly formed. It's been exceptionally renovated to a high spec throughout, but I wonder if this is enough for them to see past the proportions. Very nice. It's beautifully flinched. Beautiful I love flinched. the wooden units here. Yeah. And the range stove as well. Plenty of heat for the, the colder parts of the year. Yeah. Nice, Very nice. nice. Nice light coming through. Yeah. Both windows. Both sides. And the kitchen really for us is the focal point. It's the house of the home, isn't it? Helen spends a lot of time in the kitchen, whether she's making pickles or herbal infusions. And uh, this is beautiful. It is ideal. Well, behind you, you've got a sort of second kitchen, which is a sort of utility room with all the fridges, the work surfaces. What they wanted to keep this is a sort of old-school Welsh country kitchen, not with any kind of fitted units. This is a bit of a wild card, this house, because mm. from your spec, it's a bit too small. But we are downsizing. We do have to come to terms with the fact that we are downsizing. Yes. And this actually is the right size for a kitchen. It's, it's ample space. It's a promising start inside, so I'm intrigued to hear their thoughts on the size of the next room. Here's the sitting room. Slightly smaller than I'd thought, but it works. Yes. It's beautifully done. What is the sort of vibe you're picking up from this place? Very calm, um, very relaxing and, and welcoming. You see this huge beam here. So local historians trace that back to, as a mahogany ship beam, and that probably means that it goes back to about the mid 
1700s, early wow. uh, 1800s. Let's look at the sleeping accommodation. Lovely. It seems that the impeccable interior has indeed won them over, but there's still more to explore. On the ground floor, there's also an office, which could be useful for either Robin's work or Helen's studies. Next, we're heading upstairs, where there are a total of three bedrooms. There are two spacious double rooms and a small single. All the bedrooms are served by a well-presented family bathroom, which features a freestanding bath. We're off to explore the master, pausing briefly to admire the landing. Oh, you could have a little library here, the Absolutely. books and the view. Yes. Nice comfy chair to sit in. Yes. You don't and get then... enough landings these days, do you? Don't get enough no. landings. I do space for books and sitting and reading. Yeah. And... Absolutely. Oh, what a beautiful bedroom. This is lovely. It's very it nice. is. Well finished. Yeah. Nice and square. No exposed uh, stonework or beams. So is the no exposed stonework a good thing? Oh, yes. It's almost a serene feeling, if that's the right word to use. Yeah, I might rearrange the furniture so that you actually wake up looking at this view. Yes, lovely, over the across river. the valley. You see the river, the How valley. How green is my valley? Yes. Very green. <laughs> very green. The odd sheep walking around, yes, very nice. It's a lovely spot. Let's go look in the garden, because that's obviously important for you guys. To the outside and front of the property, there is a garage organised as a super neat workshop. To the rear, the gardens are carefully tiered and immaculately maintained. Interspersed with seating areas to take full advantage of the valley views, Helen might have to rethink her grand horticultural plans. There's also a summer house featuring a wood-burning stove. With the house receiving resounding praise so far, I wonder if the lack of flat space out here for their dogs and future poultry is going to be a sticking point. The issue, the fly in the ointment perhaps, is that it's not huge. These formal gardens are, are pretty much the extent of your land. It's terraced, and that would, for me, is a big compromise mm. I have to think about. Yes, OK. But you do get the view. Yes, it's a fantastic view. Beautiful view across yeah. the valley, yes. And see, that's the payoff. Yes. It's a lovely location. It's absolutely It is. It's yes. a fantastic spot. Of course, the question is, can you afford it? What, what do you think the price of this one is? I'd say it's one pound short of our budget. So three, 399 99 I think I would venture as much as £415,000. It is actually £5,000 short of your top budget. It's on at 395000 Well, wow. And okay. it's worth it. So yes, it's, yes. It's lovely. Just below our buyer's top budget, our mystery cottage with three bedrooms has been beautifully restored to complement the original features of the property. With an immaculately kept terrace garden and workshop, it's located in the centre of a small hamlet. Holy... <laughs> wow. Now this is a workshop and a half. I don't think you'd see me much upstairs in the house if I was down here working. You get one vehicle in and Off work around it. I think this is the best one we've seen. Yes. Workshop-wise. Yeah. This is just amazing. It's everything that I thought I didn't want and find that actually I really do. So it's lovely, really lovely. Why would any man want to leave this space, really? It's uh, an ideal working space. Truthfully, I could probably say this is our ideal home. My head's saying, hang on, you need to think about this. But my heart and my head are going to uh, have a battle, quite a battle all of their own, and I know probably my heart's going to win. So. <laughs> it's like the Mystery House is an evil genius that has upset all their plans. Because I think once Robin's seen that workshop, Helen's going to have to settle for that as her vegetable patch. Did we win with the Mystery House? I think you might have done, yes. Oh, good, let's go and find a spot to think it all over. Along the North Welsh coast lie two prominent limestone headlands that sandwich the elegant Victorian resort of Clandidno. Named the Great Orm and the Little Orm, the larger of the two rises over 200 metres from the sea and on a clear day boasts arguably the best view in North Wales. But in the late 1800s, visitors to Clandidno faced an exhausting hike to enjoy the panorama. So, a mile-long tramway was built that ferried passengers through the town's narrow streets and up to the summit. I'm meeting tram attendant Robert Donoghue to hear about the only cable-hauled public tramway in the UK. 
Remind me, what's the definition of a tram? A tram is on a road. Right. There's a, uh, a railway runs off a road. So this is a sort of half tram, half tr railway? Yes, it's known as a tramway, but in the upper section is across open country land. How many people do you take up in a year, say? We took on just on 180,000 passengers last year. Ah, so it's a, it's a popular business? It is very popular, yes. It's popular all year round. And are these the original carriages from the 1900s? Yes, it's the original carriages built and first operated here in 1902. So do I get a ride in the yes, tramway? Yes, certainly after you. Thank you. The tram operates in pairs, with the gravity of the descending car helping to pull its ascending partner up through the town. How fast are we going? We're doing probably about four miles an hour at the moment. So you can walk up quicker. Well, your legs would know it. Your legs would hurt. It's pretty <laughs> steep, isn't it? It is. It is one of the, it's one of the steeper sections. And you uh, can see the town now opening up behind you. How? Oh, and the bay, look. Yes, there's the bay. Beautiful. Although each tram has an attendant, it's the person who actually winds the cable who holds the title of driver. Drivers are based at a station halfway along the track, and it's here where we change carriages in order to continue on the second leg of the journey. It's a bit parkier up here, isn't it? It's a lot fresher. <laughs> it is always a bit fresher on the top. One of the original architects and designers was a doctor, and he believed this was the best air in the United Kingdom. Plenty of fresh air. That's why no windows. In total, the journey takes 20 minutes from the seafront up the headland to our final destination. Thank you very much, Bob. It's been a real joy. I'm glad you've enjoyed it. pleasure. I'm going to go and explore the summit. But maybe I'll see you on the way down. You might do, yes. Mm -hmm. okay. Enjoy yourself. Thanks, now. Bye-bye. At two miles long and a mile wide, the Great Orm is home to a Bronze Age copper mine, as well as a unique array of plants and wildlife. In fact, the site's geology, wildlife, archaeology and landscape are all protected as an area of conservation and special scientific interest. Now under the care of the National Trust, the Trust's Jane Richardson is giving me a heads up on the views from this magnificent vantage point. If you look over that way, you start with Anglesey, you come along the North Wales coast past Clamarvechan and then the majesty of Sladonia and the Carnarvon mountain range behind. So it's almost like a, a sort of best bits of North Wales. How wonderful. So if I came up here and had enough time to explore the whole of the Great Orm and it was a lovely day, what might I be lucky enough to kind of come across? The really, really special thing is the butterflies. And if you came up here on a summer's evening and you were walking one of the paths in the quiet, you might get the silver-studded blues just in a cloud all around you and it would be unforgettable. Oh, amazing. And what about the future? I mean, are there plans that the Trust have for the future of the Orm? 600,000 people a year come to visit. Um, but the main bit on the top which is the bit the Trust owns, has always been out of bounds. So we, what we want to explore is can we put footpaths through there? And then the other really big priority is about opening up the access for visitors and, and local people to enjoy. What a delight to get a taste of Clandidno's seaside heritage, but also the unique landscape and wildlife of its headland. It's also good to know that this special part of the Welsh coast is being preserved for future generations. This is going to be a revealing chat because I would have put good money on Helen and Robin going for house number two, but the mystery house may have knocked it out of the water. Let's find out what they think. It seems like the mystery house caused a bit of a ruckus. You were sailing straight towards the second house, but actually I think the mystery house may have put up a spanner in the works. Is that right? A huge spanner, yes. <laughs> Yesterday we were convinced it was everything we'd asked for, a large house, country location, land, space for workshops and garaging, just everything we wanted. So what happened as you were walking around the mystery house? What was going through your head? Everything in it was as we would have it. It was very well done and it, we could see straight away that our furniture would fit, photographs would go on the wall, the kitchen was a nice feature, with the range. The, uh, the gardens being terraced were different to what we have now, but as far as Helen's concerned, completely workable. I think you were saying all that, but actually you were just sold as soon as you saw the man cave, weren't yes, you? That, that's yeah, that's that's the workshop did man. sway it slightly. I'll, <laughs> I'll be perfectly honest with you about that one. You know all the tools don't come with the property. Oh, okay, it's got the tools. Okay, okay. Is that a house you would have visited? Actually, no, we, we wouldn't, because it didn't have any of 
what we thought of as our specifications. So what happens next? What are the next steps for you? Obviously, you've got your place in France to, to deal with. Our next step is to go back home to France to speak with the estate agents, find out what efforts they're making to sell our current property. And uh, we'd like to come back to Wales very soon and uh, have another look. Well, it's been very exciting because, you know, we set off one down one track and we sort of kind of veered at the last moment down <laughs> another. Uh, but I really hope that it kind of works out. And I do cross my fingers that the place in France sells because it seems like you're ripe for the move. Absolutely. Love to. Thank you very much. Bon Thank chance. You. Merci. That was a wonderful journey from La Belle France to wonderful Wales. But I do hope that Robin and Helen managed to get all their ducks in a row and move as quickly as possible because that mystery house really is an exceptional property even though it was not at all what they were looking for. And I do hope that you join us next time for more Escape to the Country. If you would like to escape to the country in Wales, Scotland, Northern Ireland or England and need our help, please apply online at bbc.co.uk forward slash be on a show. Today we're helping a family of born and bred Londoners become village people. Really pretty. Quaint. It's pretty in an, almost in a fairy tale way. But catering to multiple generations means getting creative. We uh -huh. haven't found anyone for Cheryl yet. Oh yeah. Well, I'm going to show you something for Cheryl. Cheryl, there's a garage outside. <laughs> no, don't hop. <laughs> Today I'm in Hampshire and this is the Medstead and Fullmark station on the historic Midhunts Railway. The highest station in the southeast of England, this section of the line was known as the Alps due to the steep gradients of the line running up to the station. With inclines as steep as 1 in 60, huge engines like this were needed to transport not only passengers but also the local crop of watercress up to London. In fact, soon after it opened in 1865, the whole route was affectionately known as the Watercrest Line. And later on in the show, I'll be finding out more about this historic railway, but also hopefully trying my hand at driving one of these impressive locomotives. With the English Channel lying to the south, Hampshire shares land borders with five other counties, including Wiltshire to the west and Surrey to the east. It's a county filled with vistas of pastoral beauty, where hedge-lined hills sit atop chalk bedrock, laid down over 60 million years ago in the Cretaceous period. Charles Kingsley is said to have been inspired to write his novel The Water Babies while staying near the trout-filled River Itchen in a 19th century coaching inn located in the pretty village of Itchen Abbas. The first doomsday book entry for Hampshire is found at the market town of Odium, which now sits alongside the Basingstoke Canal. The varied historic buildings here include the remains of a castle, once the home of King John, which he reportedly departed on June 10th, 1215, in order to seal Magna Carta at Runnymede. So, whether you are seeking rural idylls, an artistic muse, or a rich and fascinating history, Hampshire is a great choice for a country escape. Now, there is one caveat when it comes to setting up home in this beautiful Hampshire countryside, and that's the price. The average cost of a detached house in this county comes in at nearly £400,000. That's an incredible 40% above the national figure. And that price increases further towards the Surrey border, especially around towns like Fleet, which has excellent rail links back into the capital. So if you want your money to stretch further, then you're better off heading west around towns like Andover or towards the Wiltshire border. So what's attracting today's buyer to this county? Let's meet them and find out. Today's house hunters, mother and son Nicola, a head teacher, and Michael, a digital publisher, live in flats just a few doors apart in Parsons Green, southwest London. They want to join forces in order to flee the city for the space a country escape would afford. In Parsons Green, it's like a standard house yeah, like that you'd buy for house. a million quid. It's crazy. You know, uh -huh. It's absolutely crazy. So if you want to make the money work, at its best, then you need to move out of London. You need to move out to the country. We were thinking that if we combined the money we had and we moved out a bit, we could get somewhere where we could all live, essentially. I know, one of the other reasons is obviously we want to move uh, for space, because wherever you go in London, you're never going to have a huge amount of space.
they certainly need space because Michael's wife Holly and his mother-in-law Cheryl will also form part of the new blended household. I really like the idea of the multi-generational living. The notion that you are close to the people that really matter in terms of family, so that you can see them frequently, that appeals to me a lot. You very often need family. Plus, there are several canine members of the family to consider. My little guy, Einstein, um, has this fear of other dogs, so it makes walking them very difficult. You know, just to be able to let him run in a reasonable size garden would be lovely. She loves forests. Around here, most of the time, it's on the parks. There's something really nice, actually, about watching dogs run. I don't yeah. know, it's really weird. But um, there is something really nice about watching a oh, dog no, run. No, because it's a sense of freedom, yeah. isn't it? The hope is that life away from the bright lights and bustle of the big smoke will give them all a fresh outlook. To be able to look at the stars without all the overspill of city lights. I would actually invest in a proper telescope, yes. I actually quite like the sound of country. I like the sound of nature. Uh, I quite enjoy that. Actually, that's true. Um, I, I find that quite relaxing. At night, you don't have the traffic noise, but you have animal noises and bird noises. And there is one particular county they have in mind for the move. We're looking to move into Hampshire. Michael went to school there, so I was travelling up and down in it for years. It's kind of got everything. It's got history, it's got the open spaces, it's got its really quaint villages. It's pretty too, actually. Yeah. Hampshire's very yeah, pretty. Most important of all, they hope that joining forces will mean they are all on hand for one another. Mum's getting older, and Holly's oh, mum's also getting me. older. <laughs> so you are, it's true. I know, I'm extremely lucky to have a son that I'm really good friends with and we get on and we enjoy a lot of the same things. He is actually the most amazing son to have in the world. I'm inordinately proud of him and love him to pieces. <laughs> I love you too. <laughs> Michael and Nicola are open to living anywhere in the county of Hampshire that's within easy reach to London rail links. But there are a lot of people to consider in this property search, so I'm meeting up with mother and son in the county to get a better grip on everything they want from their move. We've got quite a different kind of house search, haven't we? Yeah. I'm looking for multi-generations. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so, tell me about it, Nicola. <laughs> so Michael what? and Holly would like to have the main house because obviously they're going to have a family, so... No pressure. Yeah, no. Absolutely, no <laughs> pressure there. <laughs> and then uh, Cheryl would have a one-bedroom. Right. And I would have a one, ideally a two-bedroom. So this house, it's... Well, it's a bit like the Waltons, isn't it? This no, main... no, no, we want our own front Separate doors. doors. <laughs> separate front oh, doors. you want your own front yeah, doors? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. And by the sounds of it, we're looking for three separate properties on one plot of land, then. That would work. That would work, yeah. Do you get on? You, I hope you all get on. Yeah, tell me you get <laughs> yes, on. Yes, yes, we do. We all get on, yeah. And all our dogs get on, yes. Yeah. Hold on, you've got dogs as well? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> there's, there's people watching this around Hampshire thinking, God, I hope that's not next to me. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so the house is big and it's versatile, maybe to split up yeah. into separate dwellings with annexes. What about outside space? Be nice to have some outside space. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, at the moment, like our dog, we've got a flat and there's no outside space at all, which means that kind of at one or two in the morning, it's always me going out for the walk. So it'd be quite nice just to be able to open a door. Whereabouts in Hampshire are you particularly keen on looking? For Holly, particularly, it needs to be close to a train station uh, so we can get into London within an hour. Right, because that's um, where a lot of our work is. Yeah, and stuff, exactly. Yeah. So I think that's the primary thing for me. OK, well, you want an awful lot. How much are you looking to spend? It would be a maximum of 1.2 million. OK. We've got three cracking properties lined up. Okay. Let's get going. By pooling their resources, Nicola and Michael have 1.2 million pounds to effectively purchase three homes in one. They'd like a one to two bedroom apartment for Nicola, a main house with at least three bedrooms for Michael and his wife, Holly, and another one-bedroom annex for Holly's mum, Cheryl. Plus, they want a garden for the dogs and to be near rail links. We've lined up three very different options to tempt them with. And at each one, I'll be asking them to guess the price before I reveal it. The final property is our mystery house, which this time could really take our buyers out of their comfort zone. You get on really well with your mum. Yep. Sat here next to me. 
Well done, Nicola. <laughs> <laughs> You're leaving your mother-in-law in with you. Yeah, I actually get in really well with her as well. And then you obviously get on very well with Holly. Yes. So it's all happy families, yeah, isn't it? Yeah. And I think it's also nice as well because both our mums are on their own. Yeah. So actually, it's quite nice to have, you know, there's other people around there and, and company and things. As Never as have I witnessed such a thinly veiled attempt <laughs> to get some ready made babysitters. <laughs> <laughs> the first property has London Rail links three miles away in the village of Greatly and four miles away in the town of Andover. It's located in the village of Thruxton. The village has two pubs, including a former coaching inn. One particularly quirky feature in the village is a classic red phone box that's now being used as a book exchange. The proposition I want to show Michael and Nicola is located right in the middle of the village. This is house number one. What do we think? It's lovely. Yeah. Really nice. I like the double fronted yep. bays. They're really nice. It's attractive. It's very attractive. Yeah. It's very, very well attractive. proportioned. Now that, just remember that. Right. That inside is one of the most impressive rooms you're likely to see in your budget. Really? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Let's go inside. Okay. Great. The barn-like addition was completed by the current owners in 2012, but the original house was built in 1870. We're entering through what could be Nicola's front door into the section I think is best suited to become her accommodation. This is your living room. Wow. Amazing. And a real fire. Yep. It's lovely, isn't it? Really oh, good. it's fabulous. I could move in tomorrow. There are a few reception rooms this end of the property that I think could be merged together, if you like, mm -hmm. to give you a nice little ground floor flat. But turning what is now another family sitting room into Nicola's bedroom, rearranging the study as a kitchen, and expanding the downstairs loo into part of the hall to make a bathroom, Nicola could have all the accommodation she requires. Closing off the door to the garden and blocking off and turning the stairs would allow Nicola private access to her share of the ground floor. This would leave the remainder of the house for Michael and his wife Holly. You've got a completely self-contained one-bedroom flat, and that garden there could be your very own garden. Not bad, is it? That's, That's not good. bad. That's yeah. not bad. Let's look into the living area okay. here for you, Michael. Now, as regards kitchen diners, I think this should be adequate for anyone. Wow. Oh. Wow. That is amazing. Look at this glass. Yeah. Oh, it's phenomenal. But what a space. Oh, that's amazing. What a space. That's amazing. Do you remember from the garden I yeah, said, yeah. look at look that at black that, bar? Yeah. Yeah. I remember that. Look at it. This is it. This is it. It's the materials they've used that gives it that feel. Really? That yes. sense of atmosphere, the range. And then the rooms off here, you're going to love this. You've got a dog room, a larder. A dog room? Yeah. Are you serious? No, it's got a little sink in there. Then you've got a utility there. And then obviously your main entrance to yeah. this, you and your wife, Holly, will be there through the boot room. OK. OK, putting a bit of pressure on you. If you were to hear <laughs> the pitter-patter of tiny feet, this is where you'd like to see them running around, oh, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. They've got all the space. Yeah. It's fabulous. All right, now let's take a look upstairs at the bedrooms on offer. Come okay. on, mate. OK. On the first floor, Michael and Holly would have a smart family bathroom. It serves two double bedrooms to the front of the house both with built-in wardrobes and also a good-sized single to the rear with doors to a balcony overlooking the garden. Lastly up here, again with views of the back, we find the master suite. I do like the six wardrobes. That would be good for Harley. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of stuff to spill. A lot of stuff. Right. A lot of clothes. A lot of clothes. And this is That's an amazing enough. old suite, yeah. actually. Could you see yourselves en masse living in this house? Yeah. Yes, actually, so, actually, I could. Yeah, yeah I really yeah, could. I could. I think it would, except we haven't found anyone for Cheryl yet. Oh, yeah. Well, I'm going to show you something for Cheryl. Cheryl, there's a garage outside. <laughs> no, don't laugh. Sorry, sorry. Should we go out and have a look at it and then discuss the land and maybe start thinking about getting the price? Yeah. With a third of an acre plot, including a gravel driveway, the rear garden is mostly laid to lawn with low maintenance borders. The real bonus here is the outbuilding. On the ground floor, there are garages and a workshop. 
But upstairs, there's a ready-made studio apartment, complete with kitchen facilities and the shower room, which could make an ideal annex. That could be a fantastic dwelling. If you did something with the ground floor of it, you may have second thoughts about being in the main house and maybe having more. your own. Absolutely. <laughs> of course, all this does cost money. So how much do you think this has on the market for? Gosh. It's got to be near the top of our budget, I'd say. 1.15 or 1.2 million. I'd say 1.75, maybe 1.1. 1.1 1. 1. 1. 1 million? Yeah. Well, this house is on the market for offers around £975,000. Right, we'll make an wow. offer. <laughs> <laughs> That's wow. it, sold. <laughs> wow. That's perfect. Okay. So why don't you go and refresh your memory? Discuss who gets what. OK, thank, thank you. Thank you very much. A great start. But I think it's not just the house's flexibility that's made it go down so well. It's the fact that the conversion, the remodel of this house has been done to the best possible standard. And if they don't buy it, I might. £225,000 under budget, this detached Victorian property has enough room in the four-bedroom house for Michael and wife Holly as well as enough reception space to create a one-bedroom flat for Nicola. There's a versatile outbuilding that could provide detached accommodation for Holly's mum. Plus, the garden is ideal for the dogs, and London Rail Links are also nearby. Much better than I was expecting. <laughs> yeah, it's absolutely beautiful. I like the fact that it's easy to split up. Actually, yes. it's really easy to split up. And we've got all this space that's at the moment empty downstairs. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. So actually, yeah. I could put the kitchen downstairs. That yeah, would be an issue. Yeah. I can't imagine they can top this. I think it's definitely possible. Yeah. I'm just amazed that the guys found this. It's brilliant. Liked it? Loved, Loved it. it. Good. So let's go on to the next one, shall we? Have, have we got to? We have to, yes. <laughs> Look, I'm not going to do all that research and just show you one house, am I? <laughs> <laughs> OK. Although Hampshire's links to the capital make it a popular location for commuters, 85% of the county is classed as rural. So to give Londoners and keen animal lovers Michael and Nicola a taste of traditional country life, we're sending them to meet fifth generation tenant farmer Robert Sampson, whose farm is one of the few in the country still using working horses, come rain or shine. We've got shire horses here. No, these are not shires, they're Persians. They're actually British Persians. What's the difference between them and shires? Um, the shires have got the hair around the feet. You march them through six inches of mud, yeah. and you can <laughs> imagine what they look so like. Nice. <laughs> that so yeah. great. And it was always a major problem in the stables, was actually controlling the uh, disease called grease, which came about through using them in muddy conditions. Originally bred as war horses, the breed's efficient use of food to output soon made Persians popular workhorses for both transport and agriculture. Robert breeds as well as trains both horse and human in equine farm work. Bring him over, so walk him over here. Today, Linus and Axel are joining him to show Michael and Nicola how to take the reins. That's it. That's it. Bring his head round. Lovely job. That's it. Right, OK, then. Off we go. Axel. Percherons are well-muscled and well-known for their intelligence and cooperation. Robert favours them over mechanised options for most of his farm work. The jobs may take a little longer, but as all the horse feed is grown on his 223 acres, there's a good saving on fuel costs. Woo! Woo! One more step. Get back. Get back. Right, Axel. Linus. Good boy. Right, come on, hands forward. There you are. Keep enough control so that you can feel you can feel them, they can feel you. Today the horses are pulling an attachment that is hauled across the ground to promote grass growth. It's called harrowing, and in this weather, I think Nicola and Michael can see why. So in this kind of weather, how long would you be out for the whole day? There are times when you just got to get on with it. I mean, in the in the winter when uh, when we're feeding stock, 
That's got to be done seven days a week, whatever it's doing. Yeah. yeah. With the harrowing completed, they're pleased that the next horse-drawn activity they're learning about involves going undercover. Oh, can you drive it on the road? You can drive these on the road. Oh, you can? Oh, yeah. Oh, right. yeah. yeah. Has it got yeah. the license plate on the back? No, nothing no. whatsoever. You don't need anything. Oh, you it's don't got... need it? Come on, Linus, no hedge trimming. Yeah. Come on, Linus, get your head out of the hedge. Come on. Naughty <laughs> boys. So if you just wanted to keep one Hershuan horse, yeah. um, how much acreage would you need? Be looking at sort of three to four acres. So we want a property with three to four acres. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I can supply you with a horse. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> Please, no more requirements for this already demanding house hunt. House number two is in the east of the county, close to the Surrey border, and just a 10 minute drive from Liphook train station in the village of Headley. As well as frequent rail links to London, Liphook provides a broad selection of shops and services. Four miles away back in Headley, the centre of the village features a 19th century pub and a church with details dating back to the 13th century. The rock band Led Zeppelin recorded the track Stairway to Heaven in a studio nearby. And the next house we've lined up for our buyers can be found on the outskirts of the village. First impressions? Pretty. Yeah. Really pretty. Quaint. It's pretty in an, almost in a fairy tale way. It looks smaller than the last one from the front. This option gives you three distinct living areas. You don't have to use your imagination as much with this house. This place, I think, we'll get to enjoy straight away. Okay. All right. Shall we? Yeah, yep. let's. Absolutely. This was originally a small cottage built around a century ago, but has been greatly extended over the years. The main house here would be son Michael and his wife Holly's domain. The spacious entrance hall leads us straight into an enormous reception room. Our first room, you probably weren't expecting something quite this contemporary, were you? No, not from the outside. It's a lovely room in the day, isn't it? What yeah. a view, actually. What an outlook rather than a view. Yeah. It's a pond. Yes, it is a pond. Yeah. Those bifold doors, yeah. followed all the way back with the sun streaming in. Beautiful. Absolutely. It's very nicely proportioned as well. Yeah, I it think so. It feels kind of right. It's warm. You, well, there's a certain atmosphere in yeah, this house. There is. And that continues through here. Follow me. OK. Also on this floor is a study, a WC, a separate utility space, and the dining room. Now, a kitchen's not massively important to anyone in your family, but it'll do for you. Yeah, absolutely. It's fine. Yeah, it's, it's fine. Works. I love the oil fired range. Yeah. It's amazing. <laughs> if you like that. <laughs> if you like that. Come and look at this. <laughs> now then, look at that. Wow. Yeah. Good. It really is the gingerbread house. It's yeah. amazing. <laughs> but it's something else, isn't it? It really is. It really is something else. Michael, you've got two reception rooms to choose from now. Yeah. Look at you, Lord of the Manor. <laughs> <laughs> this is very much a living. Yeah, yeah, a, a yeah. snug, if you yeah. like. It is a, a snug, room. yes, yeah. it is very much like that, yes. But, yet again, French windows opening out yeah. the southern aspect. Yeah. Yeah. You like? Very much. Good. Very yeah. much. I Let's like Let's keep looking too. through, come on. A seal of approval for the ground floor of the main house. Upstairs, a family bathroom serves two of the three bedrooms. First, a double room with built-in wardrobes. Then, across the landing, a single bedroom. That leaves the lion's share of this floor for the master suite, with its own dressing room and a bathroom. Now, bizarrely, you walk through the bathroom to get to the bedroom, which is just above the new extension. Yeah, it's a really nice it's room. nice as well. It is yeah. a really nice room. This whole <laughs> house is just for you. Yeah. So? Amazing. What's your thoughts, mate? Could you live here? Yeah, absolutely could. It's lovely. What do you think your wife would think about this house? I actually think she'd really like it. I think she'd like the fact that it's a bit quirky, a bit warmer. Yeah. A bit friendlier. Slightly yeah. higgledy-piggledy, sort yeah. of lookery. Yeah. yeah. At the moment, you're walking around this building... Thinking, yeah, that's great. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> what about me? Yeah. Well, what about Cheryl, yes. Yeah. Well, you and Cheryl... <laughs> Where are the rest of us? <laughs> well, you and Cheryl could possibly get your own accommodation separate. Should, should we have a look? 
Yeah. Nets. That'd be great. Set in just under an acre of land, this property is more a self-contained hamlet than a house. A private pool sits in front of a three-roomed pool house, converted to look like a cricket pavilion, with enough space and flexibility to provide mother-in-law Cheryl with a bedroom, a shower room, and a living space. And finally, across the gravel drive is another annex that could be ideal for Nicola. Now then, Nicola. Wow. Yeah, nice. good. I love that. Well, okay. straight out onto the garden. Perfect, <laughs> Perfect isn't it? Yeah. But also, your love upstairs, yeah. the bedroom upstairs, has a balcony completely south-facing as well. Oh, wow. It's pretty special. Yeah, that is. That you, is. You've got a ground floor bathroom or shower room just through that doorway there. No kitchen as yet. I don't need a kitchen. <laughs> There's a lovely pub just down the road. Yeah, that's fine. <coughs> Job done. <laughs> the space would extend if you wanted to put a kitchen in there. Right. Yeah. But also, you've got a garage that way. So you can go both ways. Is this enough space for you, then? Oh, this is enough space for me, yes. Yeah. I mean, it's probably bigger than my entire flat at the moment. <laughs> Perfect. Look at this setting. <laughs> Look at it. It's incredible. Oh, it, it is. So how much do you think this house is on the market for, then? I don't know. I'll go for the round million. OK. Yeah, I was going to go for something similar, maybe one million and fifty. OK. Well, it's... you're closer. The asking price for this house is one million one hundred thousand pounds. OK. okay. Well, the sun's come out. It's a beautiful afternoon. And I think you should look around all of these houses with a view to who gets what. <laughs> Enjoy it, OK? Thank you. Where are you going to start? Thank you. Here. Much. Go on, then. Thanks. <laughs> See you in a bit. Thank yeah. you. Despite being £100,000 below budget, this detached cottage offers a three-bedroom home for Michael and Holly, a one-bedroom poolside pavilion and a one-bedroom annex. The dogs would have almost an acre of land to play in. Plus, there's a private pool and nearby rail links to London. I like the high ceilings. It's, it's quite big. It is big. It's really big. I like it. It's amazing. I mean, it's in all this ground. It's three separate accommodations. It's... I'm gobsmacked, to be honest, that, you know, there was anything out there that actually ticked all those boxes. And a swimming pool. Huh? What can I say? It's got everything. <laughs> I love the fact that it's three totally separate properties, basically, on one plot of land. It's like driving into a little village, in effect, like a mini village. You all come in and you park, and then you walk your separate direction to your own properties. I think that separation will make a big difference over the years. And, yeah, also means that if anyone is having arguments, then uh, nobody can hear it. <laughs> Now, have you seen enough? Yeah. Are you sure? Because so. I'm happy staying here for as long as you like. <laughs> <laughs> it's glorious, isn't it? Oh, it's Absolutely glorious. Amazing. Yes, it's fabulous. Yeah. It's fabulous. Well, it's something amazing. to discuss over dinner and all this hanging around the swimming pool. <laughs> <laughs> have a cocktail first, eh? Come on. That sounds like a really That's good nice. idea. <laughs> Mother and son Nicola and Michael from Parsons Green, South West London, have £1.2 million to find a Hampshire property for themselves and Michael's wife and mother-in-law. We've shown them two great options to give them the three separate dwellings thereafter. Plus, there's still the mystery house, which could leave them spoiled for choice. I can see really myself nice. here, definitely. Yeah. You're not going to be living in this big part of the house. Well, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And I'm letting off steam in the beautiful Hampshire countryside. Ha <laughs> ha I love it! Like a pro, like a pro. When you consider what Michael and Nicola are actually after, they're looking for something that doesn't really come on the property market very often. In many ways, they're actually after a mystery house. And I think with two really strong contenders in the bag already, we can afford to show them something a bit different. Today, we're going to turn the search on its head 
and show them something far more conventional. Let's see, here we go. For the Mystery House, we're heading over the border into the eastern fringes of Wiltshire, four miles southwest of the Berkshire town and train station of Hungerford to the village of Shelbourne. Facilities in Shelbourne include a 17th century pub and restaurant and a post office and stores where the village's 600 odd residents can enjoy a freshly ground coffee. Just a short walk away at the end of a quiet lane, we find today's mystery house. You're probably expecting something crazy like a windmill. Yes. <laughs> We've gone fairly conventional. So here we are. I like the yeah. fact that it's modern. It's got these sort of clean lines. That's yeah, really appealing. It looks nice. It does look nice. So I nice. agree. Absolutely, it does. Like what you see? So like far, yeah, see. absolutely. Let's go inside. Since this is Wiltshire, they're getting more build for their buck. This is the biggest principal residence I've shown them so far. Built in the 1970s with 21st century extensions, we're entering through the front porch into an L-shaped hall. And we're headed for what I think will be Michael and wife Holly's main living space. And I was hoping you'd rather like it, because I know you like open plan spaces. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yes. It's really nice. It is really nice. You don't even realise you're in the kitchen. I know you're not big cooks at the moment. I mean, things, <laughs> things obviously change, but... Not for me. <laughs> but how much do you think you'd stay or use a room like this? Because, yes, it's a kitchen, but it feels much more than a kitchen, doesn't it? I think you'd use it a lot. Yeah, yeah. I think it'd I be your too. primary room during the day. It comes like the tenant. centre, doesn't it? Yeah. The hub. Yeah. 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 Would Holly like this? I think she'd love it. Good. Yeah. All right, let's keep looking around. On this level, Michael and his wife Holly would also get a downstairs toilet, two studies or office areas, two utility rooms, and a dog or a boot room. This larger wing of the ground floor could then be blocked off from the current sitting room and garages, which I think could be turned into self-contained living accommodation for either Nicola or Holly's mum, Cheryl. Shut the door away from them. <laughs> this is yours. OK? OK. Now, if you push through that wall there, right. not through that wall, you've got the adjoining double garage. Right. With power and everything. Uh -huh. That's the remainder okay. of your of apartment. Right. Yes. So, you like what you hear so far? I do. Yeah. Good. All right, let's keep looking through. OK. Stairs from the hall lead up to what could be Michael and his wife Holly's five-bedroomed accommodation. Two bedrooms to the front, both with views over the countryside. A bedroom to the rear with its own wash basin. And the smallest of the bedrooms here, right at the back of the house. There are also two family bathrooms, one with a shower. Four bedrooms plus this master bedroom. That is a fantastic ensuite. Have a quick peek, actually. It's worth a quick look. OK. Mm -hmm. Separate bath and shower. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Wow. Amazing. Look at that for walk-in wardrobe. Wow. That's incredible. Isn't it? <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> and the view. Well, fantastic views yeah. over that beautiful sort of common land, if you like. <gasps> is this a door well. here? Yeah, yeah. to a balcony. Oh. So far, so good, then. Loads of space. The idea of living with this amount of space I can see really myself nice. here, definitely. Yeah. You're not going to be living in this big part of the house. Well, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we could do a swapsies every so often. No. Well, look, there is some other accommodation that I think you could really taper to what you're after. Okay. Let's go and take a look at that. Right. Outside, there's around two-thirds of an acre of garden, mainly laid to lawn, including some sheds and a greenhouse. But situated across a gravel drive from the main house, it's the annex currently divided into three rooms plus a toilet that I think could offer the third self-contained one-bedroom home here. Wow. It's, nice. it's very nice. Yeah. Again, it's nicely proportioned. I've scratched my head on this one to how best configure it. But you've this got space one, yeah. to do it. You've got the shell here. It's up to yes, you how you yeah. configure it. Yes. I think it looks nice. I think it could work well. Yeah, me really too. Well. Me too. Yeah. With an overview of all that's on offer here, it's time to think about price. Well, after this fairly successful tour, 
How much do you think this house is on the market for, then? I'm going to pitch it somewhere near the first one, 975. OK. I'm going to take a leap of faith <laughs> and pitch at nine. This place is on the market for office around £1.1 million. Okay. That's more than I would have thought. Go back in the house. This is your opportunity to really compare it to the properties you've seen. Okay. I'll catch you when you're done. Thank, Thank you. you. Again, £100,000 below budget, this modern detached house is the largest so far, giving Michael and wife Holly a five-bedroomed home. Spacious garages are ripe for conversion into an apartment adjoining the main house, whilst an annex provides potential for accommodation number three. Plus, the large fenced garden is low maintenance and dog friendly. There's quite a lot of work to do, I think, to get the three different living spaces. I like the fact that it's modern. I like the clean lines. I like the space. There's a huge amount of space here. Probably not my favourite, but very nice nonetheless. Well, thankfully, it's a bit of a journey to where we're going to sit down and have a bit of a conflab. Oh, good. Okay. We've got time to think. Chat amongst yourselves. Come on. <laughs> Hampshire's fertile soil and climate make it the perfect place for crop growing. But it was only in Victorian times with the arrival of the railways that farmers found a quick and easy way to get fresh produce to the lucrative markets of London. One such train route opened in 1865, took so many tons of Hampshire grown watercress to Covent Garden, it became known as the Watercress Line. Closed to regular travel in the 1970s, a 10-mile stretch was bought and renovated by the Mid-Hance Railway Preservation Society. I'm catching up with member Derek Simmons at Ropley Station, who knows all about the historic significance of trains in Hampshire. So, 1865, the landscape of this area changed with these trains coming in and out. It, it was more than the landscape, the way of life changed. Yeah. You know, people would have lived their lives and, and died within the sound of the local church bell. That's, that would have been their world. Yeah. The railways opened everything up. Commercial steam trains last ran on this line in 1967. Giving them a new lease of life has proved to be a demanding business. The engine boilers alone had to be stripped and rebuilt every 10 years. But 21st century boilersmiths are very hard to come by. One of the challenges we have is that the skills that were used back in the 50s and 60s by British Railways don't exist anymore. Some of our guys have got those skills, but they're, they're older guys, 50s, 60s, 70s, some of them. So that's why we're looking at our apprenticeship scheme. You have to get this information passed on before it's too late. That's what it's about. The scheme's called Mind the Gap, and that's what we're trying to do, <laughs> Mind the that. Skills Gap. Well, I've heard a couple of peeps of a whistle, so I'm off to try and catch a train. I'll catch you later. Nice Thanks, to meet you. It's no surprise these engines need regular overhauling. They're seriously hard workers. Today, driver Richard Bentley is taking this 140-tonne locomotive on three return trips, each including the very steep climb to Medstead, nicknamed the Alps. That's over seven days. It's not, it's not, working day, isn't it's it? not much of a retirement for it. Oh, no. I know. Poor old bear. So how many people? are involved in getting this locomotive on the rails each day. Every day there'll be a crew of three, there'll be a driver, a fireman and a cleaner. You learn the cleaner to how the engine works. You then start learning the fireman's job, how to make steam from burning coal, and then you gradually start learning the driver's job. Right. And by the time you're sat in this seat, you can do all the jobs together. I'm not paid for what I do, I'm paid for what I know. You know? <laughs> Well, sadly, I don't have time here to complete a four-year apprenticeship. But as we head uphill towards the Alps at Medstead, I get a taster of life as Richard's fireman. Well, we're going to need a bit more steam in a minute, Johnny. Can you get some coal on the fire for us? Yeah, yeah. So where's your choice? Right here? That's it, yeah, in the middle. And a little bit either side, if you can, left and right. Yeah. You really are adding fuel to the fire. Absolutely, yeah. More effort. Keep boiling the water to make the steam that we're using. I chose the wrong line to help out on, didn't I? I think you did. Why do I have to choose the out? <laughs> when we get the bed set at the top, we then go over the top and then we drop down 300 feet the other way. So we've got to make sure we've got a full head of steam and a full boiler for the water. As we go over the top, that water level's going to drop away. So. Thank you. 
hear where some of these phrases come from, isn't it? Just going up a full head of steam, for example. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Right, we better start getting some more of that in there, I think. Uh, right. Get some in. Come on then, Johnny, put your back into it. Right, can we have a frost now, Johnny, and give us a good long blow on the whistle? Oh, yes, go on. Watch it down, good nod. And I'm on a fast track from whistleblower to driver as Richard lets me bring us to a halt. Right. Ah, there's loads of things. That's it. We go for the vacuum brake. That's the brake that puts the brakes on the whole train. So we bring it down to about, about 14 on the gauge. He's got this huge beast by this most delicate touch. Slowly. And... Oh. How's that? Beautiful. Never even broke the egg. <laughs> My spell in this driving seat may have reached the end of the line, as it's time to find out if any of today's properties are on the right track. Well, it's not often we're in a position where we've got three really strong contenders. Trouble is, last time I saw Nicola and Michael, they looked genuinely confused. So after a bit of thinking time, hopefully they're a bit closer to making a decision. Well, normally at this stage, I've got a good idea of what your favourite might be, but I haven't. So you tell me, what's going through your mind? Uh, I think for me, uh, I like all of them. What about you? Where are you? Um, pretty similar. I think what the difficult part of this process has been is the fact that you are buying three homes mm. yeah. and you have to look at the entire package. And it's difficult because you'll get blown away by a feature, you get blown away by a finish, you get blown away by a swimming pool. You have to look at you and your wife Holly, your requirements and your mother-in-law's requirements, three houses. How does this work for you? Yeah. So how do you make this decision? The more I think about it, house two, the mm. space, you have that distance between the properties. Mm. It's on the edge of a village. You can yeah. walk to the pub, yeah. walk to the shop. It's on the best train line as well. On the best train line, Fastest yes. train line. Yeah. Well, it sounds like house two is slightly ahead. I think more than slightly ahead. Yeah. If you all came down, the four of you, your mother-in-law, your wife, yourself included as well, mm -hmm. you're one unit, you should all look at a property at the same time and air everything, all your hopes and all your fears yeah. mm. at the same time, and then they'll help you make the decision. Yeah, that's true. That's yeah. true. When do you think you might be coming back down here for the second viewing, then? Oh, maybe next week? Yeah, I would think yeah. so. Good. Yeah. Hopefully soon enough to get in there before anybody else does. Well, whatever you decide, please let us know, won't you? Yes, we, we will, will, of do, course. Definitely. Thank you so much. Thank you very Pleasure. much. With a fairly unique property criteria, it's great to see that Michael and Nicola's expectations have been exceeded and that they're coming around to the benefits of house number two. Let's face it, it's only them that have seen it. There are four adults in this decision-making process and they all need to get together and look at it at the same time. But that's what this second viewing is all about, isn't it? I'm looking forward to hearing how they get on and hopefully they can all get on the same page and move to this beautiful county. See you next time. Michael and Nicola return to view house two with Holly and Cheryl, who also love the property, but they're still deciding whether to put in an offer. If you'd like to escape to the country in Wales, Scotland, Northern Ireland or England and need our help, please apply online at bbc.co.uk forward slash be on a show. Coming up, finding a couple who have moved 15 times a forever home could be a tough call. It fits the brief, but something is missing and I can't explain to you what's missing in this house for me. So will one of our properties prove to be the missing link? And the house you live in at the moment is how many versions? Two. Two versions. So you're going to have to go and buy more beds. <laughs> That's a pretty good point. <laughs> Today I'm in Devon, and this colourful stretch of coastline is a mere slice in the timeline of its rich history. 
Parts of the county date back over 400 million years, lending its name to a geological era known as the Devonian period, when the county was actually under the sea. Today, obviously, the Devon landscape is very much above water, meaning we can fully appreciate the bedrock of this beautiful county. The county of Devon is located in the southwest of England and is bordered by Dorset and Somerset to the east and Cornwall to the west. The county is famous for its spectacular coastlines and down on the southern shore it's a travel through time where the oldest cliffs feature red rock millions of years in the making whilst erosion has caused a dramatic and fascinating geological backdrop to the beaches. Inland is rich in architectural and agricultural history, with thatched stone cottages dating back to medieval times in villages such as Broadenbury, located in the Blackdown Hills area of outstanding natural beauty. Back on the coast, the ancient fishing village of Beer, named after the Old English word for woodland rather than the drink, now offers quintessential British seaside, with deck chairs and beach huts looking out to the sea. But in 1778, it was the birthplace of the county's most notorious smuggler, Jack Rattenbury. The eclectic mix of architecture here includes 18th and 19th century flint cottages, with original and period reproduction features from stone tile roofs to lead light windows. So with pastoral countryside, striking coast and picturesque historic villages, Devon really does deserve all the attention it receives from holidaymakers and escapees alike. So with all that on offer, it might not come as a surprise to learn that Devon is not the cheapest place to buy a house. The average price of a detached home in the county comes in at around £310,000. That's 10% above the national figure. Now, obviously, coastal locations like this, and in particular sea views, do attract hefty premiums. So, if you want your budget to stretch that much further, try looking inland, especially the towns of Honiton and Tiverton, as they also have rail links. So what is it about this beautiful county that's attracting today's buyers? Let's meet them and find out. Sarah and her brewery consultant husband Ian met as students almost 40 years ago. We met in 1976 and started going out together in 77. We met uh, first week at university in Freshers' Week, and pretty much been together ever since. And we'll have been married 34 years next month. They might not always see eye to eye, but they certainly have a strong relationship. We don't agree on very much, but we look after each other and support each other, and we're a pretty good team. Um, we're quite different, so I think we balance each other out. Yes, it's about understanding what each other want out of life. Sarah is very loving, thoughtful, very kind, loves mothering me um, and our two daughters. Ian is much more adventurous than me. He likes excitement, challenges, doesn't like being bored, more outgoing than I am. This loving pair have decided they want to move to pastures green, but upping sticks isn't new to them. We have moved a lot. This will be our 15th move. We've moved all over the country with Ian's work. We started off in Birmingham. Uh, we've lived in Cheshire, Cambridge, Nottingham, um, Bath twice. So we feel it's about time that we found somewhere that we probably quite like to stay. The last house that Ian and Sarah owned was in Wales. But when Ian secured a work contract in Sussex, they sold up and are currently renting a two-bedroom house on the outskirts of Brighton, yet another urban location. Now that Ian's contract is coming to an end and their two daughters are grown up and living in the west of the country, they've decided it's time for one more move to the peaceful countryside of Devon. It's a county they know and love, so one where they'd like to set down roots. The countryside is lovely. I'm desperately keen to be close to the sea and be able to walk along the beach, whether it's raining or in the sunshine. Ian's hoping less time working will leave more time for him and Sarah to spend together enjoying their new home. We're doers. We've done houses up in the past. I'm not saying we want a huge project, but we have done houses up and we're quite practical people. 
I'd love to have some chickens and uh, have our own eggs. Quite like pigs as well. Okay. My love is my gardening. I like my sewing and my knitting. So with their Welsh house sold and cash in the bank, plus Ian soon to complete his contract, they're ready to start their house hunt and find what they hope to be their country home. I am excited. I want to be somewhere that I can stay and hopefully make friends and keep these friends and, and, and um, build on that, I feel. We've had so many houses in the past and generally they've, they've worked reasonably well. Um, and I want this one to be spot on. I would love for this to be the house that is our last move. The challenge of actually making a house into a home. Um, I can't wait, wait for that. Sarah and Ian would love to live within striking distance of the sea and have asked us to concentrate our search along Devon's southeast coast, not far from the border with Dorset. And before we begin the search for their 16th home, I'm meeting them in the county to find out the exact credentials that will help them make their final move. So welcome to Devon then. Thank you very much. Nice to be here. Lovely. Lovely. Fantastic. Now you guys are in a funny position, aren't you? Because you're now a bit more footloose and fancy free, grown up children. Oh, that's correct. You can live anywhere. Yep. Why the southwest? I think we like the countryside, we like the views. It's just a, a more leisurely pace of life. But it must have been tricky making your minds up. I mean, you've moved to, you've moved to house how many times? 15 times. I mean, you should have wheels on the bottom of your houses, really, shouldn't you? <laughs> we haven't unpacked all the boxes yet. No, you probably never got a chance. But then, has it been a difficult decision moving here? No, I think this is the area we like the most. Having lived in lots of places, you sort of start to get a feel of where your more favourite places yeah, are. Yeah, and yeah, it yeah. Tends You've got more experience yeah, living yeah, yeah, around, yeah, haven't yeah, you? Yeah, yeah. Well, let's talk about what you're after then. First of all, the environment, the location. I've always wanted to live close to the coast. I mean, my ideal would be walk out of the, you know, the bedroom French window straight onto the beach. Ideally walking distance or a very short drive to a beach yeah, then? maybe five, I, five ideally, ten but, miles. Ideally, yeah, five, ten miles would be comfortable. And I think also we're looking at maybe, you know, retiring a little bit, so we don't want to be too isolated because that right. will give us problems later on. What about the house itself? Let's talk about size first of all. Well, I keep saying two bedrooms, but so it's a minimum of two bedrooms. I think we should have at least three. Well, we're not going to have an argument, but <laughs> <laughs> two to three bedrooms, <laughs> or four at the most. And I have to have two toilets. OK, what else? A lovely big open kitchen. Do you like cooking Ian and baking? Cooks. I love cooking. Do yeah. you do? He does. Right. He does okay. the cooking. What about outside space? Don't really want to be overlooked, mm -hmm. so fairly decent-sized garden. OK. What about style of house? Do you like a certain age? I don't think it matters. I like uh, character. This is going to be fun these next couple of days because you've got slightly differing opinions. We don't think, agree think, on anything. Oh, well, good. But having bought 15 homes in the past, you must come to a resolution fairly easily. Well, that's partly because we alternate. Oh, we have one I like, then one Sarah likes. So whose turn is it to choose this time? Sarah's. It's mine. Right, OK, well, you want the bigger house. Oh, uh... Right, <laughs> let's talk about budget. Maximum, really, should be £500,000. OK. However, I like bargains. Well, yep. <laughs> all right, well, how soon can you move? Tomorrow. Yeah. Really? Yep. yep, we're in rented accommodation, we're cash buyers. Ideal. OK, let's get going then, this way. Thank you. Sarah and Ian have a budget of £500,000. And for that, they would like a character property with a large open plan kitchen providing a social hub in the home. Sarah wants the house to have at least two toilets. There should be between two and four bedrooms, a good sized garden, and they want privacy without being too isolated. They also love to be close to the coast. We've chosen a fantastic selection of properties for our buyers to view but the all-important price tag will only be revealed after they've completed the tour of each one. And the final visit will be to the mystery house, which may be going out on a limb, but if our house hunters are prepared to do the same, their search for house number 16 could be over. We 
We're kicking off our tour of South East Devon in the village of Uplime, close to the border with Dorset and just under two miles from Dorset's historic seaside town of Lyme Regis. Here the pretty resort sits at the foot of a hill, surrounded by majestic cliffs looking down on Lyme Bay and the English Channel. There are steep winding streets to explore and plenty of ways to make the most of the water. A five minute drive takes us back into Devon and the village of Uplime, where there's a shop, a village hall and a pub, all local to our first property, a detached mid 19th century house with modern additions. Okay then team, property number one. First impressions. It looks lovely. Interesting. Interesting. Well, <laughs> that's good. That's a good start. It looks a nice size. It's mm -hmm. a comfortable size. It's got character. I think it's quite attractive. You? Yes, I agree. Yeah. It has a nice feel to it. Please go inside. Yes. Lovely. Yes, Let's go. please. With a large gravel driveway, this detached period house comes with a single garage to the side. The property was extended and updated around eight years ago. All the rooms on the ground floor lead off from the central hallway. You've got a small study area there. Now, you said you like the idea of a decent-sized kitchen diner. What do you think of this one? Nice size, yeah, good size. ideal size. Yeah. Fantastic views out of the windows. Oh, beautiful. Wow. Right over the valley there. I mean, that is splendid, that isn't is it? That is stunning. Really stunning. Yeah, that's very good. You do the cooking, don't you? Yeah. Yep. So, you tell me. Well... It's, it's not ideal. I mean, I don't like the dark surfaces, but there's nothing here that can't be changed. No. But, you know, the size, the orientation of it is, is, yeah. is ideal. Yeah. Right, well, let's see where you'll be sitting now and waiting for your tea. Come with me. Next door and at the back of the house is a large rectangular living room with views and access to a stunning garden. This room is in the original part of the property and so over 150 years old. It's a nice size. It's size. a good size. It's, I like it. Lots of light. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I didn't realise that garden was there. Yeah, you're surrounded by your own gardens here. Yeah. You're not overlooked, which is something you said was quite Absolute, important yeah. to you. Yeah, important. absolutely. Would you be tempted to have a dining table in here as well, or do you keep it just as a living room? It doesn't matter. It's a, it's a room to live in, isn't it? The important thing is to set it up so that we actually want to come into it. Yeah. So you don't want to be necessarily connected into your kitchen diner. You like that separation, do you? No, I'd be happy for it all to be one yeah. room. We can, but I can see if we're not careful, we'll always be in the kitchen. The only positive is it's got a fire. Right. That might draw us in in the winter. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I think come the summer and the spring, I'm not sure we'd come in here much. It looks like the downstairs layout may be failing to win Sarah and Ian over. But the ground floor does offer one of the two essential toilets Sarah has asked for. And upstairs, there's not one but two more. Up here, there's a neutral family bathroom that serves two of the four bedrooms. The smallest is currently in use as a twin and a double that has an aspect to the rear. Then there's another bright double with its own ensuite shower room, which just leaves the largest of all the bedrooms, again with its own ensuite, providing this home with its toilet number three. What do you think about this for a master? Very good. I like having two windows. Nice views, very light. And the house you live in at the moment is how many bedrooms? Two. Two bedrooms. So you're going to have to go and buy more beds. <laughs> That's a pretty good point. <laughs> yeah. So, would you like to live in a home with that sort of view? Yes. I think um, there are things we would change, mm -hmm. but nothing, nothing major. You know, repaint it. That'd be it. Be fine. OK. Well, look, the less you do in the house, I think the better, because outside you might be getting busy. Okay. Come on, mate. <laughs> The outdoors is somewhere both our buyers enjoy. And whilst they differ on their requirements for inside, neither of them should be disappointed here. For this is an immaculately kept garden that comes with a veggie patch, a greenhouse and a potting shed. This, surely, is a gardener's paradise. Absolutely. And it goes down over that bank a little further into a pond. Wow. All in all, the plot size is around a third of an acre. Fantastic. Absolutely beautiful. So, my question to you is how much do you think this house is on the market for? After you, dear. <laughs> um, 510,000. OK. Ian? Yeah, just 500. Right, Spot that on. was easy, wasn't it? Well, good guess. This place is on the market with a guide price mm. of £499,500. Yeah. yeah. So you're both there or thereabouts. Yeah. 
I think that's quite a lot of house for the money. I do. I think that's good value. Good. With that in mind, go back into the house, refresh yourselves of what you've seen, and I'll meet you whenever you're done. All right? Okay. Lovely. Thank you. Go right in. This delightful detached house has crept in just under Sarah and Ian's budget, and it still manages to offer them over and above what they've asked for. There's a large, sociable kitchen diner for cook Ian to get busy in, four bedrooms and no fewer than three toilets to choose from. Outside is a gardener's paradise, giving plenty for them to potter about in as they head into retirement. I was pleasantly surprised. It's a very attractive house, much bigger than it looks from the outside. What I think would work really well for us is the large kitchen diner. Um, the sitting room was superb. The garden is spectacular, would require quite a bit of maintenance, but not impossible to sort out. Generally, I was very impressed. So that's your first formal viewing of a house in the southwest. How did it go? Very good. Very yeah? Good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, there's only one of three. Let's keep going. Devon's stunning scenery, beautiful beaches and temperate climate are a real draw to the county and three miles inland from the world-famous Jurassic Coast lies the Bicton Park Botanical Gardens, which attract over 50,000 visitors a year. These historic gardens formed part of the estate that Lord John Roll, an MP and the largest landowner in Devon, inherited at the end of the 18th century. He created this botanical paradise for his wife, Lady Louisa. Today, the house is an agricultural college, and the gardens are now owned by Valerie Lister and her partner, who took over the grounds in 1998. King gardeners Sarah and Ian have come to meet Valerie to get some inspiration. So, Val, which garden is this, please? We're stood in the Italian garden at the moment, and this was laid out in the 1730s, and hasn't changed a lot since it was laid out. So what types of garden have you got here and how big is it? The gardens itself are 64 acres, but they are divided into smaller areas. How long does it take to cut the grass? The gardeners cut the grass with hand mowers and it takes them from 7 in the morning until 10 o'clock, so they try and do it before we open to the public. Oh, gosh. Next stop for our couple is the architecturally awesome Palm House, home to around 15 species of palm trees from all over the world. It's the second largest structure of its kind in Britain, and it was renovated in 1985. Oh, it's amazing, isn't it? So this is the Palm House. This was built in the 1820s, and as you'll see, it's got 18,000 panes of glass, mm -hmm. and it was built by Lord Roll for Lady Roll's love token. It's an amazing building. It must have been quite a feat of engineering in those days. I think it was, and you'll notice that the panes of glass are curved, and that's so that the rain runs down the centre of the glass as not to rot the ironwork, and that's how the rain cleans the glass, so that saves us a little job. So how does the building work? The building itself has underfloor heating, of which we use in the winter, but obviously in the summer, as you can feel now, we're melting in here. But we do have vents which are operated by good old-fashioned string, so we get a good airflow through the building. The Palm House is one of four glass houses in the gardens and was the inspiration behind the larger glass house of the same name at Kew Gardens. There's so much to take in here, and the best way to see it all in one visit is by train. We're going to be going off in this carriage, but Ian, we have a surprise for you. How would you feel about driving the train? I'd love to, thank you. If you'd like to go to there, and Sarah, if you'd like to go into the carriage, and I'll follow you in. This train, called the Sir Walter Raleigh, was hand-built especially for the gardens around ten years ago. <laughs> the, horn. the track is a mile and a half long, and it takes a leisurely 25 minutes to do a full circuit of the park. How many times do you go around a day? At the moment, four. Yeah, during a week, five at weekends. You'd never get bored of this, would you? This is the big lake, and in a minute you'll see the house to the bridge. This is the best thing here in the next Full of inspiration for their new country garden, it's time for Sarah and Ian to continue the search for it. For our second property, we're journeying just under nine miles west along the coast to the seaside resort of Seaton. The pretty town sits on the 95-mile-long Jurassic Coast, 
with the southwest coastal path passing through it. Here the Axe Valley meets the sea and the sheer cliff face overlooks an endless stretch of Shingle Beach. The town's narrow streets are teeming with shops and eateries and it's easy to while away the hours here, relaxing and admiring the scenery, taking a gentle seaside stroll along the promenade or getting a different perspective along the three-mile tramway first operated in the 1970s. Just a ten-minute walk from the action, we find our second offering with a bird's-eye view of the town. So, first impressions, probably the best spot to get them is from here. What do you think? Nice. Yeah, I like that. Pretty. Isn't it just? Very yeah, pretty. Nice wisteria. Yep. Now, look behind you. <gasps> oh, the sea. View of the sea. Yeah. <laughs> <gasps> Absolutely beautiful. Yep. Very nice. So, the property was built 18 years ago. Yep. Now, yep. what do you think of the style of the house? It's very attractive. It looks quite neat, mm -hmm. tidy. Yeah, well presented, isn't it? Yeah. Good. Let's go inside. This modern two-tone house was built in 1997. It may be young, but its tiled facade gives it character, and no one can dispute its outstanding outlook. Hopefully, what it has to offer behind closed doors will be just as well received. The front door leads to a long, narrow hallway running down the middle of the house. All right, let's start with Ian's favourite room. A bit smaller this time. Yeah, I'd prefer it a bit bigger, but uh, lovely views out the window. Yeah. Nice and light. Well, there's things we can do with it. Well, there are things you can do with it. You've got a room behind you there. Yes. That's a proper brick yeah. wall. But my thoughts were, just put a doorway through there, that becomes a utility. Yep. And then, do you remember when you looked at the front of the house, there was a lean-to yes. conservatory? Yep. Push that kitchen that way. Yep. It would make a fantastic dining yeah. kitchen. It Definitely. needs opening up. It does, yeah. That shadow of a doubt. Yeah. But what's the feeling you get when you walk through the door here? It's a bit like... Uh going to a holiday cottage. Yeah, you feel that? Yeah, mm. yeah I mean, it's a lovely, nice house, but it's not giving me, you know, a wow feel inside at the moment. Let's keep looking through. Let me squeeze past you there, mate. Right then, it opens up here into the living and dining room. Right. Oh, yeah. yeah, good space. Isn't yeah. it? Nice space. It's nice and light. Yeah, it is. Yeah, and you've got the views again. Yeah. It's still not wowing me at the moment, but there's a lot I think we could do to make it feel more in keeping with the way we like to live. Mm -hmm. Well, mm. Uh, yeah, I mean, it could be a single room downstairs almost, couldn't it? Mm. Mm. I mean, and there's a lot of work to do that, mm. but, but an open plan with then bringing the garden into you. OK. Upstairs. A winding stairway takes us up to the first floor, where the family bathroom comes complete with a corner bath. Plus, there are four bedrooms. There's a narrow single and two doubles, with one in use as a twin. But I reserved the very best for Sarah and Ian. Now, your master bedroom, I think, could be fantastic. Oh, yeah. yeah next. It could be. Could be. Waking up to a sea view. It's a view. beautiful view. But you can't see it from where you are in bed. <laughs> do, you, do, you, do you understand what I say? Shuffle down the bed a bit. Why don't you put your head that end and your feet that end, and then you could see out and see the sea? Agreed. You got an ensuite behind you. OK. Right. And? Nice. What about the bedroom? It's the right size. It fits the brief, but something is missing, and I can't explain to you what's missing, but something is missing in this house for me. The highlight for me is the view. Let's go and take a better look at it. You've got a balcony here. Yep. Come on, mate. So it's not just a sea view. Look at that. It's beautiful. It's stunning. Absolutely it's beautiful. Stunning. Let's go down to the garden and start thinking about price. Yeah. Off. Okay. Off to you. Thank you. Outside, there's a terrace garden at the rear of the property with a patio at the summit. Then everything else is at the front of the house. There's a detached garage and plenty of parking space leading up to a lawn. And, of course, the stunning vista. The house. Mm. The views. The, views. the garden. It's beautiful. Let's guess the price of this house. Right. I would reckon this is on the market for four, six, five thousand. Okay, Sarah. I'm going to go below. I think it's four hundred and fifty-five thousand pounds. The asking price for this house is four hundred and seventy-five thousand pounds. Yeah. If you could get it towards your guesses, would that interest you? Yes, that would be fair. 
This house with a view has rung in at a generous £25,000 under Sarah and Ian's budget, meaning they can make the most of the fabulous location and outlook and still have cash to spend on creating the home they want. There's already the potential to create a really good sized kitchen diner which would complement the existing living space. The property also features four bedrooms, so there's plenty of room for visiting guests. And let's not forget the wonderful views which look out towards the nearby coast. My initial reaction when we walked up to the house was excitement. I loved the location, the view was stunning. The house is attractive, so first impressions were great. It's a good size. Oh yeah, yeah. It's lovely. And plenty of storage. Yeah, very good. This house is a bit of a conundrum because it seems to give us lots of what we want, but it doesn't give me the feeling that I could make it into a home. And I still haven't quite worked out why that is. I think we're going to have to go and have a beer and think about it a bit more. All done? Yep. You know what? I've got through that house nice and quick. There might be time for a bit of dip in this thing on the way home. Excellent. Fancy that? Let's okay, go. Look forward to it. It's the second day of our tour of South East Devon, searching out a characterful home for Sussex-based Sarah and Ian with a budget of £500,000. We've still got the mystery house, which could well offer the fresh perspective their house search needs. I think it's lovely. I yeah. like it. And you can see the views out of the bed. And I'll be serving the Devonshire locals as I learn about an eco-friendly tipple. Look how much Look they love that! It. <laughs> Well, I'm happy that both of the houses worked well yesterday on paper, but according to Sarah and Ian, there was something special missing from them. But they couldn't really put into words exactly what that was. So I'm hoping to flush that out with the mystery house today. Now, in terms of location, it's the most rural out of all three properties, maybe too much so. And in terms of style, well, it's the kind of house that will have some people running for the hills at first sight, but others may be falling in love with it at first glance. Obviously, I'm hoping for the latter. You know you're going to see the mystery property. Yeah. How do you think we're going to challenge you with this house? I suspect it might have, could have a lot of land, possibly. I think there may be a bit of work to do to it. Yeah, I think there might be a project. A project, a P word. Mm -hmm. It could be a two-bed apartment overlooking the sea. We'll see. <laughs> For our mystery house, we're travelling west down the coast to the village of Branscombe. Located just inland, the village is known for its charming display of cottages and thatched roofs. It's like stepping back in time here, as it's still possible to see the last surviving working thatched forge in the country, which was originally built in the 16th century, as well as a fully restored water mill now owned by the National Trust. A short walk from the village leads to the rural setting of this semi-detached thatched cottage, our mystery house. Perhaps a little more out of the way than Sarah and Ian had hoped, but I think they'll agree its seclusion is worth it. Now, if you're after a house with personality, I think we might have just found it. <laughs> My word. That's fantastic, isn't it? Now, there's many reasons why we chose this property for you. Obviously the look of it, the character that it gives you. And look at that view. That's a sea view as well. Yeah. Fantastic. That's a lovely view. It's so peaceful. Yeah. Really peaceful. This is much more in line with the peace and quiet that I think we prefer. Yeah, absolutely. I, I agree. It is more rural than I ideal, but... Yeah, but I think we're probably more comfortable with this. You'll be surprised here was built in 1952. 1952, wow. It's beautiful, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. The setting's fantastic. Yeah. Let's look inside. Because this picture-perfect cottage is relatively youthful, it benefits from many mod cons not found in an older property. Let's start in the kitchen. Oh. oh this, yeah, this is much more our style. It's lovely. Yep. Yep, it's a beautiful size. I can see myself being in here. It feels comfortable, it feels yep. homely, doesn't it? Yeah. Yep, very good. Yeah. This is actually a holiday home. Gosh. Yeah, but you, you get, you're reacting, you'll probably get a nicer feeling here than you've seen yep, so far definitely. with the properties. Yep. Because it's 
more neutral. Yeah, maybe. Next door is a full-time home. Everybody else is full-time, so don't right. think you're going to be living in the middle of nowhere on your own, because mm -hmm. you won't. Mm -hmm. So around the side, you've got the rest of the kitchen. Beyond, you've got a utility and then a downstairs loo. Lovely layout. Very simple. Good. I'm glad you're liking it. I think you'll be impressed with these other rooms through here. Let me show you. Across the hallway and on the other side of the front door is an elegant dining room, roughly the same size as the kitchen. And beyond that is a characterful sitting room. It's lovely. Oh, isn't this cosy? Well, it's cosy, but because you've got that middle room, you've got space, haven't you? Mm, yep. Are you surprised in how you're reacting to this house? No, no. not at all, no. No. This, is this in your back of mind what you thought you might be looking for, but didn't know it? This is more the sort of thing we would go for. Is it? Yes. Didn't, didn't want to admit it. We like this style. It's quirky, isn't it? It's that personality coming through again, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Let's see what you make of the bedrooms. Come on, mate. I couldn't have hoped for a better response from Sarah and Ian. This marvellous mystery house is certainly selling itself, but it remains to be seen whether it could become their home number 16. A central stairway leads us upstairs, where there's a neat white family bathroom with an adjacent toilet, and three bedrooms. There's a single at the back, and two doubles at the front. One in use as a twin, and another, which is a similar size, has an added bonus. Now, master bedroom, because you've got a little walk-through closet area going into an ensuite at the end. And you can see the views out of the bed. Out of the Juliet balcony. Mm. Yeah. But this is not, I mean, this isn't a huge room, but it's, I don't know, it's big. It's big enough. It's comfortable. I think it's lovely. I yeah. like it. You've seen reactions from each other in 15 successful mm. purchases. How do you gauge each other's reaction at the moment? I think Sarah's falling in love with the house. How do you think Ian's reacting? What's going through his mind? Oh, I think he really likes it. Let's talk through the whole package and get outside, okay. but also start getting ahead around how much this property might be. Mm. It seems this home-hopping pair are both keen on the accommodation on offer here. I just hope the garden matches up to the house. It's raised above the property and makes the most of its remote location with fantastic views towards the sea. On a clearer day. Now up here, we get a vantage point for a couple of things. The amazing view, obviously, mm. but also we're right on top of a double bay garage that comes with the property. Yeah. And on top of the side is put a little summer house. Guests have been known to sleep in there of an evening. Pretty cool, isn't it? Yeah. That's fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Really, that would be really useful. You also get to see all of your garden. What do you think? How on earth do you cut the grass? Well, you can see it's cut on levels. I think you could do more with this. Yes, agreed. It's, it's, it's pretty low maintenance at the moment. Could you see yourselves living here? Definitely, I, yeah. I think so, yeah. Mm, yeah. Can you afford it? Guess the price. So I'm going to say 500 and 25,000. Uh, I think it's above budget. I'll go for the 515. OK. The asking price of this mystery house is... offers around £465,000. Gosh. Oh. See, I think you, you were swayed by uh, the fact you liked it. Yes. Oh, and I was swayed by you. Oh! <laughs> so, go inside the property. See you in a bit. OK. Ooh. This chocolate box mystery cottage is on the market for £35,000 under our buyer's budget. It may be remote, but being semi-detached, it has neighbours, so it's not too isolated. The large farmhouse kitchen gives plenty of room for entertaining, plus there are three bedrooms on offer upstairs. Outside, the elevated garden gives incredible views, as well as a place to rest and enjoy them in a pretty thatched summer house. I was pleasantly surprised when we turned up at this delightful thatched cottage. It is so pretty. It's lovely, I can see both Sarah and I living here. Oh. That's, oh, that's big that, as well. That's bigger than I expected. It is, yeah, lovely. <laughs> <laughs> My only concern about the mystery house, it is really in the middle of nowhere. I need to sit down and have a look at a map just to get my bearings as to exactly where its location is, I think. So, have you enjoyed looking around this mystery house? Yes, very much. Yes, very good. Well, that's the last thing we're seeing. So, suck it all up, get in your head, and we'll sit down later on and go through it all. Lovely. Great. Okay.
Devon's rich landscape of rolling hills tumble down to deep valleys, which have some of the finest rivers in the country running through them. And the fantastically fresh water that flows here has one rather appetising use. It's perfect to turn into local Devon beer. I've come to the Otter Valley in the Blackdown Hills area of outstanding natural beauty to meet Patrick McCaig, a fifth generation brewer whose father established an eco brewery here 25 years ago. It's won multiple awards, not only for its beer, but also its eco friendly credentials. I was very excited, I must say, to hear that I was going to be looking around a brewery, yet you asked me to meet you by a pond. Well, it's no ordinary pond, really. This is a place where we manage to recycle a third of the water that we use to brew with. We actually use this wonderful system called the willow beds to actually deal with it and clean it up. Well, how much water are we talking about, then? For every pint, you've probably got about three pints waste, so there is a phenomenal amount of water to deal with. Solid matter is removed from the waste from the brewery, and the water then flows around 30 metres via an underground pipe to a series of ponds, which act as water filters. The roots of the surrounding trees provide oxygen to the water, which helps bacteria and bugs flourish. They in turn purify the water by eating the impurities in it, before it flows back into the river otter where it was sourced from originally. Now this is probably not a, a new method. No, this goes back to medieval times. How much would you be saving? We'd be saving about £60,000 worth of haulage a year. Do you recycle anything else? We recycle our hops, which go for leaf mulching, and we have yeast, which goes to the pigs. And then we have our brewer's grains. That's our biggest lump of stuff that needs to got, be got rid of. And that gets taken to cattle. But I can show you some of those in a minute. If you oh, like. lead the way, then. Brilliant. This way. Just a couple of fields away is the brewery, where Patrick produces over 7 million pints of beer a year, sold mainly in the southwest of England. Well, I must say, I wasn't expecting to see this. This is... Well, I've been to a few breweries in my time. This looks like a space station. It's pretty impressive. So what have we got going on here, then? This is brewer's grains. They're the grains that have come out of the back end of the brewing process, and we've taken a load of sugar out to make the wort, which gets turned into beer. So you've taken sugar out of this? Yeah, 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 exactly. So basically, when the grains come in from our maltsters, it, it's full of a lovely sort of malted sugar. Right. We extract the simple sugars, and we leave the complex sugars behind and we don't want those in the beer, so they're great for cows. You can eat this. Probably. It is, it's, yeah. almost, it's almost like porridge. Not quite as nutritious, I think, but, <laughs> but the cows love it. Patrick sells his unwanted brewer's grain to local farmers, and today we're taking it to a dairy farm a couple of miles down the valley. So here's our lovely ladies. Now, how much this do you give to this farm here? Well, I should imagine probably about 20 tonnes a week comes here. Look how much Look how they, they love, love that! <laughs> so if you didn't provide this food stuff to this farm, where would they be getting it from? They would get a similar product, but from sort of up country, and that, of course, that involves trucks, moving stuff around. This environmental impact again, isn't it? Yeah. Well, it all sort of ties in with working with the community. Good for you. Well, let's get rid of this food stuff, because I must say, all this talk about beer is making me rather thirsty. Patrick's lovingly brewed Devonshire beer is back at the brewery, waiting for us in his cellar with its grass-topped roof, continuing the eco-friendly theme. It attracts local wildlife to the brewery, as well as providing insulation for the cellar. Not only that, two-thirds of the cellar has been built underground, providing a perfect cool climate for the beer, meaning no need for electrical chilling machines. Now, what we've got here... Talk me through it. Well, this one's the Otter Amber, which is actually... Um, there we go. There. Thank you. And um, the Otter Amber is actually one of the newest beers we've done, and it's got a lovely fruity hopness to it. Well, first of all, you can smell the hops in this, different to the bitters as well. It's almost got a touch of the sort of summer ale to it. I could see you know, exactly. the quaffing this in a beer garden. that's actually why it really goes well during the summer. How many of these do you produce, then, a week? During the summertime, over 2,000 of these go out every week. Well, I'm sure you're going to be going far and wide with this beer, so we wish you the very best of luck Great for the future. Hey, cheers. The cows have been fed and I've been watered. Now it's time to see if Ian and Sarah have fallen for any of our Devonshire properties. Well, from where I was standing, we saw the best reactions overall in the Mystery House. But I'm not sure whether it's a case of Ian and Sarah keeping their cards close to their chest or after having bought 15 houses previously, they're not getting wildly excited about buying house number 16. Let's find out their thoughts. So, you've had a bit of time to chat things through. I think it's fair to say the Mystery House was your favourite. I certainly saw the best reactions there. Is that the case? But it did have challenges to it, so what's your thoughts? I was a bit worried, 
when we started going deeper and deeper into the countryside. Yes. And then we arrived and I was pleasantly surprised at the very, very picturesque setting of the thatched cottage. Well, do you think the fact that you saw other homes nearby maybe sort of allayed any fears of isolation? Yes, certainly. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And there was nothing there was nothing wrong at all with the first two houses. They gave us what we'd asked for, but there was just something not just didn't make us go, ooh, yeah, we really love it. So mm. what's next for you? No, oh, we're, we're certainly going to put an offer in on it. <laughs> just like that? Yeah. Oh, we're certainly going to put an offer in on it. Mm. Yeah. If we like somewhere, we never do second viewings. We just, that's it. Because if that's your initial reaction and you like somewhere and you think, I can live there, then you just put an offer in. That's brilliant news. I mean, okay, I'm surprised. 15 houses in, this is mm. your next house. Yep. Who knows? And actually, it's, it's, a, it's a different house. It's an, another one to add to the list, isn't it? We've never it lived is. in a thatched house before. So it's, a, it's another one to add <laughs> to the list. It's great news. I've certainly enjoyed showing you these three very different houses. Mm. So good luck at the estate agents. Thank you very much. Let us know how you get on. Thank you. We see it so many times that in looking at houses, sometimes all it takes is the X factor, something special, call it what you will, but sometimes a house has to give our buyers a special feeling in order to tip them over the edge. And today it looks like our mystery house has done just that. So much so that I think we could well be looking at Ian and Sarah's house number 16. I certainly hope so. I keep all my fingers crossed. See you next time. Ian and Sarah put in an offer on the mystery house, but unfortunately it wasn't accepted. So their hunt for a Devonshire home continues. If you'd like to escape to the country in Northern Ireland, Scotland, Wales or England and need our help, please apply online at bbc.co.uk forward slash 